This happened back in September of 2010. I'd been with the Forest Service six years by then. Folks say I'm good at my job, but some things stick with you no matter how much training and experience you have. I'm Jasper Landry, by the way. Search and rescue out of Yosemite National Park. The call comes in the evening, like they often do. A young couple overdue from their hike, last seen on the mist trail. It's a popular one, well-traveled. They've probably just lost track of time, dawdled by those stunning waterfalls. That's what I tell myself as I pack the truck under the darkening sky. But as I drive through the park gates, there's that nagging feeling in my gut. You get to know it after enough years. It whispers that this isn't just some folks getting lost. Reaching the trailhead is like stepping into a whole different world. Police cruisers already sit flashing blue and red, and the parking lot is swarming with anxious faces, park personnel, a sheriff's deputy, and the parents of the missing hikers. The dad's face is hard, eyes narrowed in silent fury. The mom's a crumpled mess of tears and apologies. I've seen that look as well. Briefing myself with the deputy, I learned the couple, Greg and Olivia, were day hikers, locals who knew this trail. They weren't planning anything overnight. Greg's an accountant, Olivia a substitute teacher. Folks with sensible hiking boots, not ones to go off-trail chasing adventure. They should have been back by mid-afternoon. I head into the forest, flashlight carving a path through the deepening twilight. Yosemite's beauty has this way of lulling you into complacency. Then the sun drops and the trees twist into menacing shapes. My partner, Miller, meets me further up the trail. He's a seasoned hand, seeing his fair share of trouble out here. But tonight... Even he has a tightness around the eyes, a sense of something not quite right. The first sign we find is Greg's phone. Crack screen face down, lying in the dirt. Strange. Cell service is spotty, but not fully gone out here. Still, it's an ominous start. We push further, leaves rustling under our boots. Miller calls their names, the voices swallowed up by the vastness of the park. Up ahead, there's a break in the foliage. Not much, just a patch of trampled undergrowth and a flash of something red snagged on a branch. It's Olivia's scarf, bright against the green. My heart does a hard thump against my ribs as we approach. The ground is churned up, footprints messy and overlapping. And right there, a streak of crimson staining the leaves. Blood. My mouth goes dry. I radio it in. More crews are on their way. Police, dogs, the whole nine yards. It's well past dark now. We split up, Miller and I, combing the area around the scuffle marks. That's when I see it, a single, deep gouge in a massive redwood, a slash of bark ripped away. It's high up, near seven feet off the ground. Whatever made that wasn't an elk, wasn't any forest dweller I can name. The sound comes next. A guttural growl, low and rumbling, right there from the darkness beyond the trees. Miller and I freeze, back to back, flashlights sweeping the woods. Two eyes gleam back from the shadows, unnatural yellow against the pitch black. Huge eyes. My blood runs cold. And then the thing charges. It's a blur of muscle and teeth. Huge, fast. I can't even guess the size of it. I fire a warning shot into the air. It doesn't flinch. Miller and I backpedal, shouting and waving our flashlights. For one horrible moment, I think it's over, that we're going to be the next messy headlines. Then searchlights flare from the distance, voices echo across the trees. More of our crew charging to the rescue. The creature, whatever it is, hesitates. That's our chance. 
We run for it, heart pounding a frantic tattoo in my chest. We don't stop running until we reach the tree line, the safety of numbers. But as the chaos of deputies, dogs, and park rangers swirls around us, I can't shake the image of those eyes. Yellow and slitted, filled with a chilling inhuman intelligence. The search goes on through the night. When they finally find them, or rather, what's left of them, it's too gruesome to even tell the parents in detail. Olivia's body is the worst, the way it's, well, let's just say we can tell why she wasn't putting up much of a fight by the end. The official explanation is a mountain lion attack. A rogue may be rabid. But Miller and I, we know what we saw. No cougar is that big, none move that fast, or stand upright like a man. The claw marks on that tree, they were from hands, not paws. We never mention it, not in reports, not to anyone. Miller transferred out to the Mojave Desert within a year, said he couldn't stand the smell of pine needles anymore. I get it. I'm still here. Some folks call it stubbornness. Maybe I'm trying to prove something to those empty woods, to the thing that still lurks out there. But mostly, it's for people like Greg and Olivia, for those who lose themselves in the wild. We've all got to hold on to the belief that someone will be there, shining a light into the darkness. After all, the night is vast, and the forest deeper still. Some trails you don't come back from. Some things aren't meant to be explained. Locals talk about old legends in these parts, about a shape-shifting creature, a hunter that's either man nor beast. They call it the, you know, the destroyer. Now, I'm not one for superstition, but sometimes, in the dead quiet of a long night shift, I wonder if maybe they were onto something all along. This happened to me on October 12, 2001, and honestly, I still lose sleep over it. I'm a SAR guy for the Forest Service. It means search and rescue, in case you didn't know. Name's Everett, Everett Barnes. Been walking the beat in these woods for 15 years now. I was on regular duty that day, nothing unusual. Not like the stuff that still makes my skin crawl. Now see, I'm used to folks getting lost in Sequoia National Park. Happens all the time. Usually, it's some idiot hiker on a day trip, thinks he's a modern-day John Muir until he bites off more than he can chew. We give them the talking to, patch him up if needed, then send them on their way. But this time? It was different. I got the call around three in the afternoon. Two campers, a couple, vanished without a trace. Their campsite was a mess, like there had been a struggle. No one heard a thing. Now, mind you, the sequoias out there, those giants, they make everything seem muffled, almost peaceful. But this had a different kind of silence to it, a wrongness. I arrived at the scene by four. The park rangers had already secured the area. I met them, talked to the witnesses, just neighboring campers, and their reports weren't much help. Said the couple was quiet, kept to themselves. No way to know if anything was off before they disappeared. I started the grid search. We do that, spread out in lines, call for them, listen for a response. It's slow, methodical. That's the thing about this kind of work. It demands patience more than anything else. You can't rush, you can't panic. Folks put their lives in your hands and you respect that. Walk ten feet, call out. Another ten, then again. Hours can go by in what feels like minutes. It was getting on towards five with dusk settling in. I was deep into the woods, sunlight filtering down through those massive branches like it was stained glass. The air was still, not a breeze. 
You ever been so far away from the road that the quiet just swallows you whole? No cars, no planes overhead. Just nothing. That's the kind of quiet I was in. That's when I found it. The first thing that told me I wasn't dealing with a simple missing person's case. Wasn't a person at all. It was a boot, lying in the middle of the trail. It was a woman's boot, pink and white, the kind a serious hiker would never wear. I picked it up and gave it a look over. It was covered in dirt, and there was a dark stain on the toe. I don't like saying what I thought it was. I kept walking, calling out the couple's names like trained. But inside, my gut was churning. See a boot by itself? That's a lost item. A boot with a blood stain? That tells a story. Maybe another hundred yards onward I saw the backpack. It was ripped open, its contents strewn across the ground. A hairbrush, sunglasses, a bag of trail mix. And there snagged on a branch, a piece of torn pink fabric. That's when I keep my radio. Told Control I was escalating the search, needed backup, the whole nine yards. The sun was setting for real now. Time meant nothing with the long shadows making the forest feel like a maze. I moved quicker, a low-level dread crawling its way up my spine. I'd heard the stories, mountain lions, the occasional bear. But there's noises out here that even a seasoned SR guy can't explain. Rustles, creaks, the feeling of eyes on you. Most times, it's your imagination playing tricks. This time? I wasn't taking any chances. That's when I saw it. Just up ahead, a flicker of motion, pale against the dark brown of the trees. My heart thumped in my ears. Was it one of the missing campers? Hey! I called out, cupping my hands around my mouth. I'm here to help. The thing didn't answer. Instead, it turned towards me. For a heartbeat, I thought it was a man, tall and stooped. Then it moved again, and the wrongness of it hit me all at once. Too long, the limbs too long. The way it jerked its head, almost bird-like. And the smell, dear God, the smell. Like rotting meat and something earthy I couldn't place. My training kicked in. I reached for my sidearm. But before I could get a clean shot... It was gone, vanished into the trees with an ungodly speed. I stood there, pulse drumming a wild tattoo in my head. My breath came in ragged bursts. This, this wasn't natural. That's when I heard the scream. It was a woman's voice, high and panicked, cut short with a sickening, wet sound. I tore through the undergrowth, gun raised, heading towards the noise. I knew I was supposed to hold tight, wait for backup, protocol be damned. I burst into a clearing, and what I saw, I'll take it to my grave. The woman, or what was left of her, was crumpled against a tree trunk, her clothes shredded and stained crimson. Her eyes stared out empty, reflecting the dying light. The other half of her, it was missing. Just gone. And above her, perched on a massive redwood branch, sat that creature. It was hunched over, gnawing on something with vicious hunger. I could see its shape more clearly now, the wiry thinness, the way its skin stretched too tight over sharp bones. Hairless, almost gray, its head swiveling to fixate on me. The eyes, they were yellow, and they glittered with a chilling intelligence that made my stomach heave. I fired. One shot, then another, both echoing like thunderclaps through the silent forest. The creature hissed, a chilling, inhuman sound, and dropped out of sight with impossible speed. There was a crash of breaking branches as it vanished deeper into the trees. My hands were shaking so badly I could barely operate the radio. Backup arrived a few minutes later, 
a whole swarm of M Rangers, SAR, even local cops. We scoured the area, found nothing. No trace of the missing man, no trace of that thing. The official report went down as an animal attack. Mountain lion, maybe a bear gone rogue. It wasn't the whole truth, but no one would have believed me anyway. For weeks afterward, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. All I could see was that woman's eyes. That creature crouched over her, the yellow gleam of its stare. I tried to convince myself I must have imagined it, that the stress got to me. But deep down, I know what I saw. And I also know it's still out there. Sometimes, when I'm out on patrol and the forest feels just a little too quiet, I swear I feel its eyes on me. Waiting. Watching. Whatever the hell it is, it's never forgotten. I hear folks call these creatures cryptids, Bigfoot, and the like. I just call it the devil, and that sequoia clearing? That's its hunting ground. It's been years, a good chunk of my life now gone. I can smell the damn swamp again, though, taste that thick, muddy air. I'm Elian, by the way. Back then, I was into hunting, knew my way around a rifle and the backwaters of the Everglades. Life's different now. I drive a forklift for a living. Less excitement, more back pain, but you won't find me complaining. This all started because of Randall. Nice enough guy, if a bit of a know-it-all. Randall was big into ghost hunting, had all the fancy cameras and those gadgets that pick up static or whatever. I'd laugh it off, but hell, a weekend fishing while he futzed with his gear seemed harmless enough. We were way out in Fakahatchee Strand, cypress knees poking up like tombstones in the murky water. Randall had his maps spread out on the boat, muttering about ley lines and some old tale about a haunted swamp camp. Figured some bored locals made it up to spook tourists. It took a wrong turn, and I mean a wrong turn, not just missing our usual spot, to set things off. We got the boat tangled in a mess of roots, and the engine sputtered out. Perfect. Randall, usually all calm about his ghost nonsense, started getting edgy. Blame me, then the faulty GPS, then the humidity messing with his equipment. I was about to call it quits, cut our losses, when he jerked upright and pointed. See, he hissed, there that movement. All I saw were shadows writhing in the thick mangroves. Must have been gators or maybe a big python on the prowl. Either way, not something I wanted to tangle with. But Randall was already scrambling for his backpack, pulling out some infrared camera thing. By the time he shoved the camera screen in my face, I wished I hadn't been so skeptical about his ghost stories. That thing staring back at us was no animal. Tall, hunched, moving with a jerking, wrong sort of rhythm. The image was grainy but I caught glints of scales and claws that looked more like talons. And then it moved. Not towards us, but deeper into the undergrowth. Vanished like smoke, leaving only the buzzing of mosquitoes as proof it had ever been there. I wanted to chalk it up to a trick of the light, nerves even, but there was a deadness to its eyes. Eyes I'd seen before carved out on shrunken heads and totems that washed up on the beaches sometimes. Stories my grandpa told seminal tales about a stalking thing, a bone picker lurking in the swamp's heart. Randall was babbling excitedly, words like evidence and discovery thrown around. I wanted no part of it. But before I could argue, we heard it a scream, cut off like it had been choked out. A human scream. We both looked back towards the tangle of mangrove roots, towards where we'd last seen those yellow eyes gleaming in the dark. Found the boat, 
rocking gently now. Randall's fancy camera lay smashed on the deck, a bloody handprint smeared across the lens. We didn't speak. Didn't need to. I gunned the engine, fighting the snagging roots and my own rising panic. Back at the dock, we called the rangers. They searched the area, found nothing. No blood, no body, just Randall's wrecked equipment and our stammered, barely believable story. I quit hunting after that, left the Everglades behind. Some folks say I was a coward, leaving Randall out there. Maybe they're right. But I saw what lurked in those shadows, and the knowledge of it still haunts me. They never found a trace of Randall. The rangers put it down to an accident, a gator attack more than likely. But I know better. Sometimes, when a storm wind whips up and I smell that sickly sweet rot on the breeze, I imagine I hear footsteps in the mud by my trailer. Footsteps followed by the faint click of claws on asphalt. There are old stories, old warnings, about the deeper parts of the Everglades, places where the sun don't quite reach and shadows hide things from the light of day. Randall, with his science and gadgets, he never stood a chance. Some things ain't meant to be understood. They're meant to be feared, meant to keep you out of the dark. Some legends, it turns out, have teeth. The locals call it the Swamp Walker, I think. Whatever its name, I know one thing, it's still out there. And maybe, just maybe, it knows mine too. Turns out, city life wasn't so safe after all. A few months after leaving the swamps, I woke one night to that same rotting stench. Thought I was going crazy at first, hearing the distant call of swamp birds from my dingy apartment. Turns out, you can't escape your demons just by changing addresses. One night soon after, my neighbor went missing. Nice lady, always gave my dog treats, had a laugh like a wind chime. Her apartment was, well, let's just say gators are tidy eaters compared to whatever left that carnage behind. Police questioned me, of course, the new guy with the swamp rat reputation. They found traces of mud by her windowsill, strange prints that didn't match any boots or shoes in the building. And me? I didn't wait for my own door to get kicked in. Packed my few belongings, left the forklift job without a word. Been on the move ever since, taking odd jobs in small towns, never staying long. Always looking over my shoulder, checking motel vents and storm drains with an old hunting flashlight. Some nights, it almost seems worth it. The quiet of the open road, the way the stars shine so much clearer away from the city smog. It nearly lulls me into a false sense of security. Nearly. But then there's nights like tonight, rain splattering against the windshield of my beat-up truck, the stink of a nearby swamp seeping through the cracked window. And every shadowy figure by the roadside looks too tall, too gaunt. See, here's the thing about monsters, the ones out in the swamp, and the ones you carry inside. They never truly let you go. Maybe Randall was the smart one, charging into the darkness with his fancy gadgets. At least he went down fighting for some sense of purpose. Me, I'm just running. And no matter how fast you run, the past, those claws in the dark, they always catch up sooner or later. It happened a few summers back, when I was still living in Utah. I'd moved out there after college, lured by the mountains and the open landscapes. Figured after five years behind a desk crunching numbers, I deserved to unwind and let myself enjoy nature more. So, I settled into a tiny town outside Zion National Park kind of an outdoors a tourist hub with kitschy lodges and cafes lining the main drag. I loved the sense of adventure that hummed along under the quietness of the place. 
My name's Kieran, by the way. Back then, my biggest problem was usually whether my Jeep needed yet another wash after kicking up all the red desert dust. Life was, well, kind of simple. One weekend, my buddies talked me into doing an overnight hike on a little-used trail called the Spires. Apparently, it was known for some dramatic rock formations and, most importantly, fewer crowds. They promised a proper desert camping experience, complete with beers by the campfire. Sounded ideal. The air was already simmering hot when we hit the trailhead mid-morning. Zion in the summer wasn't exactly beginner-friendly, but neither was I a hiking novice. It took a few hours to navigate the relentless switchbacks through the lower stretches. It was dry, barren, that kind of unforgiving heat only the southwest can cook up. But finally, we broke through the scrubby pines into a more shaded canyon. That's where things took a strange turn. Ahead, we spotted a small alcove tucked into the side of the canyon. Just a dark opening in the towering rock face, almost shrouded in shadows. As we walked closer, I felt. I wouldn't call it fear, but an undeniable sense of uneasiness. My usual carefree rhythm hit a snag. Maybe the heat was getting to me. Then I saw them. Three deer carcasses arranged neatly near the cave mouth. It looked intentional, the clean way they were positioned on the ground. They seemed too recent to be natural. This wasn't the kill zone of some predator. And something about the way their bodies were opened up, no animal does that. What the hell? My buddy Finn's voice trailed off. There was an edge of alarm beneath his usual light-hearted tone. None of us dared go closer. My gut told me the smart thing would be to head back to the main trail, abandon this hike altogether. But I could sense this weird tension thrumming through my friend group. Admitting defeat after something unsettling felt kind of pathetic. I rationalized someone messing around, sure, but we might as well keep an eye out from now on. We continued forward. Voices pitched an octave louder than usual as if to compensate for the eerie silence surrounding us. Camp that night was tense. No late-night beers, no swapping stories around the campfire. Sleep didn't come. Just the occasional snap of a twig or the low howl of wind cutting through the rocks, which set my every nerve on edge. At first light, we packed up fast— almost a silent agreement to just put this weird day behind us. Maybe that's all it was, right? The canyon walls began to close in as the morning wore on. That oppressive feeling settled back over me, worse than before. Like eyes boring into my back. We picked up the pace. There was something about the air itself here. It was heavy, almost charged with an unpleasant energy. None of us wanted to name what we were feeling, but the vibe was unmistakable. There was something very wrong. And then it happened. We were moving in single file, me towards the back, when someone up ahead let out a sharp yell. In the same flash, I heard this horrible gurgling screech echo through the canyon. Turning, I saw it. I wish I hadn't. A flash of movement, dark against the pale rock. Not some mountain lion or desert creature I could name. Not human either. Too lean, too tall. Its form flickered in and out of focus, like a glitch in my own vision. I caught a glimpse of a bone-thin limb, claw-like hands tipped with points too black and shiny to be nails. And a face, twisted, stretched, and that awful gaping maw lined with too many teeth. I don't know how long I stood paralyzed in shock. Fear doesn't even start to explain how that moment felt. It was as if reality itself bent the wrong way, and this nightmare leaked in. Then pure survival instinct kicked in. We scattered, sprinting down the path like our lives depended on it. Which, of course, they did. 
I ran faster than I've ever run, all senses overloaded. I heard that unearthly shriek behind me, and my friend shouts for help cutting off one by one. My only thought was escape. Every breath burned, every rock I dodged could be my last. I've no idea how I managed to keep my head enough to remember a shortcut I'd spotted on the map while planning the hike. A winding side trail with no clear destination, rarely marked. But it was away from that thing, and hope beats any logic in those moments. I burst through the brush and onto a gravel road just as the sun was reaching its height. Luckily, some campers passed by with their truck and drove me back into town. Later, the police questioned me about my missing friends. Nothing came from their search, and my story that some rabid wild thing attacked us didn't really land. Truthfully, I barely believed it myself. There's no tidy ending to this. Finn and the others were never found. People whispered, Mountain lion, freak accident, maybe even falling victim to another hiker out there the kind the news reports on once in a while. No one believed what I really saw, but I still carry that image vividly, burned into my brain. Every now and then, the local stories creep up online, people mentioning strange sights, eerie cries heard up in the canyons. Eventually, I packed my bags. Couldn't stay there anymore. Not when every hike meant looking over my shoulder anticipating that unnatural shape lurking just out of sight. I had to go somewhere busy, somewhere with buildings and cars and loud human sounds. Nature? Never in the same way again. A while back, I stumbled onto some forum, people sharing accounts similar to mine, glimpses of gaunt humanoid figures, a horrifying hunger in the shadowed eyes. Then it clicked skinwalkers. That ancient, terrifying Navajo evil. I don't know, maybe it's more comforting to have a name for the nightmare than to face the fact that some things, some creatures, may always defy simple comprehension. But one thing's for certain, if I'm ever in the woods again and feel that familiar dread crawling down my spine, I'll be running the other way without hesitation. A long time ago, maybe five years? Four? Whatever, it still feels like yesterday. It all started in the backcountry of Glacier National Park. I'm an outdoorsman, always have been. Love the fresh air, the trails, the quiet. You might think that living close to an enormous park means I spend every weekend hiking, but truth is, I have a busy life. Wife, three kids, two dogs, free time comes in little pockets, so even a short drive up to the park was a big deal. Got an invitation to go fishing from a good buddy of mine, Garrett. We've known each other since high school, and back then fishing and camping was basically our thing. I figured he knew I needed it. Bad work week. Wife stressed. Life. You know how it is. So, after much debate, I said what the hell. Garrett had the perfect spot. Some little, unnamed lake hidden deep in the park. Few trails up that way, no crowds. Seemed right up my alley, and to his credit, the fish were biting like crazy. We filled a bucket in only a few hours. Just after noon, we split off for a bit. Said we'd meet back around three or so. I figured I'd wander into the trees, find a decent spot to chill under the shade. Now, I won't bore you with details, but as you can imagine, nature tends to call when you're out in the middle of nowhere. Found a quiet patch of pines, far enough from the water's edge, did my business. I always go the extra step, dig a little cat hole, you know, leave things tidy. It's respectful to the environment. No one wants to come across. Well, never mind. Anyway, there I am, 
digging around, and I noticed something a little strange. At first, it just looked like a pile of old bones. Elk, most likely. There's an abundance of them up there. But as I clear the earth, it takes shape. Can't exactly tell you what it looked like. Nothing I'd ever seen, that's for sure. Not quite an animal skull, too rounded. But those teeth, a row of misshapen fangs, all different sizes, sharp as fish hooks. And the size of it. I'd always figured those pictures of cavemen fighting some monstrous predator were exaggerated. This thing could easily fit my head in its jaws. The weirdest part was right near the back of the skull. Almost like horns, except bony and crooked. They jutted up and around, making these loops near the top. Honestly, the damn thing looked alien. A shudder ran through me. No idea what could leave behind a skull like that. Never had much belief in Bigfoot and that nonsense, but well, you get out there in the woods alone, your mind makes up its own monsters. Quickly finished covering it up. That skull wasn't part of my fishing trip. I rushed back to where I left Garrett and found his gear was untouched. Figured he must have gotten another hot spot nearby and moved his setup. Called out for him a few times, nothing. It was strange. Garrett's the reliable sort, the guy who brings extra blankets, you know? Not the kind to disappear without a word. By five. A nervous feeling wormed its way into my gut. Garrett might be a lot of things, but disappearing wasn't one of them. The sun was starting to sink behind the trees, casting those long shadows, and every rustle of leaves made me jump. This didn't feel right anymore. Finally, I made the decision to pack it in. I got lost. Not entirely lost like I didn't know how to get back to the trailhead. Lost enough to realize that those old landmarks looked unfamiliar. Trees I couldn't quite remember passing. No matter how much I thought I was keeping it together, fear not away at my focus. And that's when I saw it. Silhouetted against the dark pines, an impossible figure stood on the ridge above me. At first, I thought it was a hiker, despite the odd hour. But the way it stood, hunched and gangly, the way it seemed to sway a little, that wasn't human. My blood ran cold as it tilted its head. Not exactly a head, really. More like a skull, that same disturbing shape I'd found buried a couple of hours earlier. This thing was enormous. And worse, it wasn't antlers on its head I saw now. They were bone, curved out of its skull, jutting into the sky. Just like my find. Panic hit me like a tidal wave. Everything in me screamed to run, but my legs went stiff as dead wood. The creature stared. I swore I saw the empty sockets of its skull turn straight towards me. Then it gave a shriek, the sound ripping through the trees a horrifying screech between an animal and an old rusted hinge. That shriek snapped me loose. I ran. No sense of direction, just a wild dash of desperation through the thick forest. Trees whipped my face, branches tore at my clothes. All I heard was my own labored breathing and the pounding of my heart. It felt like forever, a lifetime in those panic-filled moments. But finally, I saw a familiar trail marker ahead. I didn't stop to see if that thing followed. Just tore out of the trees, stumbling along the trail at a breathless sprint. I kept running until I spotted the flicker of taillights, the blessed sight of my friend's truck back at the trailhead. My knees nearly buckled as relief washed over me. Never been so happy to see my own damn vehicle. Hopped in, fumbled with the keys like a drunk, and finally managed to tear away from that horrible place. No cell reception out there, of course. I drove like a maniac, not stopping until I saw city lights and stumbled into the first populated place I could find. 
gas station, convenience store, somewhere filled with people and fluorescent light. It wasn't safe to go home with whatever stalled those woods. Not yet. Eventually, when the shaking subsided and I could make my throat work again, I called everyone I could. Garrett's phone went straight to voicemail. Wife was worried sick. Police weren't much help at first. Missing person? In some national park? Sir, they see that every couple of days. Maybe he went backwards camping after all. Maybe he met someone. They weren't convinced, until I mentioned the skull. That got their attention. Search teams went out at first light. Two days of combing through those thick woods. Nothing. No trace of Garrett. No trace of anyone ever even being out there. I showed them where I found the skull, but by then the whole area had been scoured. Whatever that damn thing was, it didn't leave much evidence. The cops had their own theories, of course. Animal attack. Runaway. Suicide. All nonsense. They didn't see what I saw. They didn't hear that shriek. I started drinking heavy. Kept trying to convince myself I'd hallucinated the whole thing. Maybe some toxic berries? Bad air? I don't know. Anything to explain away the impossible. But sometimes, at night, I see that swaying form against the moonlight. A month later... A hiker was found in another section of the park. Half eaten. They closed the trails in that area for a while. Official cause was ruled as bear attack, but word gets around in those small mountain towns. The gruesome way they found that poor guy. Well, there was enough left to piece together, and what I heard whispered over bar tops made the hair on my neck stand up. That wasn't a bear. They talked about those horns, about the misshapen teeth, exactly like that bone-chilling freak I saw in the woods. No one knows for certain what lurks in Glacier. They might call them legends or rumors, but after what I saw, the legend feels all too real. Sometimes, especially around the anniversary of my trip, I think about those who go there looking for the same peace I crave. I wonder if they've heard those stories. I wonder if they realize those forests don't belong to us. I think we forget sometimes just how small we really are. Garrett knew I needed that trip. And now? His kids have no dad, his wife's a widow, and my own family will never fully recover from what happened to me. All because we dared to step into the domain of a skinwalker. I stepped out of my house, feeling just as tired as ever. I zipped up my jacket against the chill of the air. My name is Leon Davenport, and I had recently moved to Barrow, Alaska. This small town sits at the northernmost point of the United States and offered me peace and quiet from my past in New York. A smile crossed my face when I thought of how different everything was nowadays. As I walked along the snowy path close to the edge of town, I observed how nature felt untouched in this place. The vast tundra stretched out before me, and behind me lay a town that barely changed over time. People here were friendly but kept to themselves, which suited me perfectly. One evening, after working at the local grocery store, I found myself walking home under a sky full of stars I had never seen before. The beauty filled me with awe. But my tranquility didn't last long. As I approached an old wooden bridge leading back into town, something caught my eye on the other side. A figure stood in the shadows near the creek, completely motionless. At first glance, it appeared human, but to me, something seemed off about it. Its physique suggested that it was taller and more muscular than any man I'd ever met in my life. Curiosity got the best of me, 
and I continued towards it while keeping a safe distance away. It wasn't until our eyes met that fear washed over me like an icy wave. Its eyes were an unnatural shade of yellow with a piercing gaze. It turned around slowly and started walking away from me on all fours. Deciding not to continue pursuing it, I rushed home with questions swirling in my mind about that creature's existence and whether or not anyone else had seen it before in Barrow. My roommate Gilda Bryson only received half a conversation from my side that night before she got pulled into an emergency at work, leaving me alone to dwell on my thoughts. I sought answers about Barrow and its secrets. My curiosity led me to a quiet old man named Victor Whitaker. To my surprise, he laughed at my question and warned me about pursuing it further. He said the humanoid wolf beast was rumored to be ancient protectors of the Inuit lands, bringing pain and death upon anyone that ventured too close. His words only added fuel to my desire for answers. But as days went by, I forgot my thirst for knowledge. That was until people began disappearing. First, it was lone travelers, then members of the community vanished without a trace. Every utterance of someone missing reminded me of that chilling encounter. With fear building within the town, a search got organized. We gathered together, arming ourselves with whatever weapons we could find in case we crossed paths with this creature. Some were skeptical about the idea of battling an unknown enemy, but they pushed their doubts aside when another person vanished. One night, while searching in pairs deep into unexplored parts of the tundra, Gilda and I stumbled upon something truly horrifying. The ground beneath our feet suddenly became slick with blood. Following its trail led us to a small ice cave. We slowly entered despite our apprehension and found the brutally mutilated remains of one of our missing neighbors. Before either of us could call for help or warn the others, we heard guttural growls echoing through the cave from behind us. Before we could react, the humanoid wolf creature lunged at Gilda with ferocious speed. The panic and horror left us unable to scream for aid. I clenched my fists in anger and fear as I stared into its yellow eyes once again while Gilda fought back with everything she had. She managed to wound it with a knife she always kept on her belt that wailed in pain before redoubling its attack. With everyone's lives at stake, I made peace with my past and found the courage to fight back. I tried to think quickly. If we couldn't fight this creature ourselves— we needed to get our friends as fast as possible. I shouted for Gilda to run, readying myself to follow her towards our group. Gilda, still locked in combat with the creature but aware of my plan, managed to push it back momentarily and sprinted away from the cave. I followed quickly behind her, the snarls of the enraged beast chasing us. As we reached the edge of the cave with our lives intact— a sharp pain pierced my leg. I looked down and saw that the creature had managed to slash me while I retreated. Through gritted teeth, I called for help, hoping that our search party wouldn't be far away. Thankfully, within moments a handful of our friends showed up, armed and anxious. They saw my wound and immediately took their positions alongside Gilda and me prepared to confront this mysterious wolf-like being. However, despite its relentless desire to harm us mere minutes ago, it was nowhere to be found. Our friends helped treat my injury as they skeptically examined the area for any signs of the creature's existence. It was only when Gilda led them into the cave where they discovered the gruesome scene. I told you! This thing is no joke! She yelled at them. They were horror-struck by what lay before them. It was now clear this wolf creature was not some figment of our imaginations or a simple wild animal. Meanwhile, I realized that calling for help had likely driven it away, either out of fear or tactical retreat. Despite its intimidating appearance and aggression, 
seeing us unite might have been enough for it to hesitate or reconsider its strategy. Our group agreed that we couldn't simply resume searching. A new plan was necessary. We headed back towards town as hastily as we could on my injured leg, discussing how we needed more people involved in fighting whatever this monster was and if we knew anyone who could shed light on its nature without delving into superstition or folk tales. Back in town, we reached out to local hunters and trappers for their expertise in tracking large predators. Given the gory evidence of the creature's malice, they agreed to join us and teach us more about self-defense. Even though none of them had ever encountered anything like this mysterious beast before, they felt they understood enough about hunting fearsome creatures that a strategy was possible. The group also searched for clues about the creature's origins by talking to people from neighboring communities who might have experienced similar incidents. Throughout our conversations, we couldn't shake the idea that this malevolent humanoid wolf might be some obscure subspecies or even what legends would call a werewolf. But we cautiously avoided entertaining supernatural causes. After all, folklore would not help save our lives. Gilda and I wished it hadn't taken something so awful happening for all of us to band together. It was heartbreaking thinking of the lost members of our community whose lives might have been spared had we joined forces sooner. Over the course of a few tense days, our group implemented strategies to lure out and exterminate the creature. When it became apparent that it was not as predictable as other predators, Local officials coordinated with military units briefly stationed nearby to conduct an extensive search through the tundra. Before the squad arrived, our group made sure to warn them of the ferocity and intelligence this being exhibited. They appreciated our information but showed visible annoyance at our attempts to draw similarities between it and a werewolf. Finally came the day that everyone mobilized their efforts in pursuit of the villainous creature. A sense of determination gripped us all as we combed through ice caves and trekking uncharted terrain. Then one night, an intense confrontation ensued between the creature and military personnel assigned to take it down. Using their coordination and training methods, they outmatched the beast and brought it to its death. Seeing the body laid out, we couldn't help confirming its resemblance to a werewolf, but regardless of its origin, it no longer haunted our tundra home. We mourned those who had been taken from us, and life resumed with a newfound sense of unity and vigilance. As years passed, we never forgot the threat this creature posed to our community. We taught new generations to remain cautious in their daily lives ensuring our scars from that harrowing series of events would guide them towards a safer path in an unpredictable world. I hadn't expected to find solitude so deafening. The isolation of the Bald Mountain lookout in Idaho was a sharp contrast to the bustling clamor of my life in Boise. Here, the vastness of nature consumed me. My role as a fire lookout was straightforward. Watch for smoke. Remain vigilant. It was supposed to be uneventful until September 5th, my birthday. I'd befriended a gray jay, which I whimsically named Bartholomew. He'd flit near my cabin, sharing crumbs of my mundane meals. This companionship was an unexpected reprieve from the stoic trees and silent skies. On that day, I decided to venture down a trail I hadn't taken before, rewarding myself with the exploration of my temporary wilderness home. The air was cool, with the unmistakable scent of pine and damp earth. As the sun began to dip, painting the sky with strokes of orange and purple, an unsettling quiet took hold. That's when I stumbled upon it, a sight so violent it lacerated the serenity of nature with macabre precision. A circle of woodland creatures lay around a granite boulder, their bodies arranged in eerie symmetry. 
My mind grappled for rationale. Poachers? Some twisted ritual? Every forest sound became amplified as dread coiled within me like an insidious vine. Scurrying back to my tower under the condescending gaze of looming evergreens, I convinced myself that reporting this discovery was paramount. However, upon returning, I found my radio dismantled on my desk, an array of wires and components arranged like mechanical entrails. That night was relentlessly long. Sleep evaded me as every shadow held diabolical potential. Morning brought no solace. My radio refused to yield to my hesitant attempts at repair. Bracing myself for another reconnoitering trek back to the grotesque circle for clues might lead me closer to understanding or madness, either option particularly alluring. At dusk, I stood again before that abhorrent arrangement now tainted with fresh tracks that snaked back into the depths of the forest. A tangible invitation or a warning? Retracing these marks led me unwittingly deeper into unfamiliar territory where whispers among the trees felt suspiciously human. The terrain steepened. Underbrush reached out with claw-like branches threatening to unveil any secrets I hid even from myself. And then there it was, a dilapidated shack clothed in neglect and shadows nestled between two scorned pine sentinels. Its doorway gaped like a silent scream frozen in time. Inside, remains of long-expired provisions confirmed human presence once here. As nightfall approached, growls not carried by any known beast erupted from within those forsaken walls, stripped bare of all pretense at civility or intent other than pure survival. I turned from the doorway knowing that whatever resided within that shack was beyond my understanding or control. With no radio to call for assistance and the certain knowledge that the tracks I had followed would not lead any would-be rescuer back to me, my sole option was retreat. I moved quickly but quietly, avoiding the detritus of the forest floor that might betray my passage to whatever was in the shack. I focused on reaching my tower, securing the hatch, and surviving until my relief arrived. The night was alive with sounds, sounds that I now knew to be more than just the nocturnal stirrings of forest creatures. They seemed to follow me until I reached the clearing where my tower stood. Days passed in tense isolation. I rationed what food I had and watched as whatever made those tracks seem to circle and test my sanctuary. Then one morning... Help arrived, a group looking for their missing friend, someone who had ventured into these woods and never returned. We found his body not far from that desecrated circle of stones I had discovered days before. Torn apart, with marks that no animal could make. I left the forest with them, knowing I could not explain what happened nor prevent it from happening again. Heavy equipment moved in later, bulldozers and men who asked no questions about what lurked in those woods, only eradicated it all. No more towers watch over those woods. They are now a barren expanse under open sky. But when night falls, sometimes I catch myself listening intently for a sound out of place, a remnant of fear that perhaps not everything was truly destroyed that day. I remember the way the sun filtered through the canopy of trees in Arapaho National Forest where I worked as a ranger. My name is Tormund Foss, and until that day, the quiet had been a refuge, the rustle of leaves a familiar song. Yet what occurred would warp those peaceful memories into an inescapable nightmare. My shift started with routine patrols and cleanup. I chatted with some hikers about trails and wildlife, jovial encounters that lulled me into a false sense of security. That normalcy shattered when I found what first appeared to be campsites turned inside out belongings scattered as if a storm had set upon them. But there hadn't been any storms. 
I radioed dispatch for backup to search for any missing campers when I stumbled upon something gruesome. The earth was churned with deep furrows leading away from one of the sites, ending abruptly by large, unnatural impressions in the soil. The earth told of struggles and frantic escapes, yet no blood stained the ground. It was meticulous in its violence. A family of four was unaccounted for, parents and twin girls. Their gear was abandoned, their tent torn apart from what seemed like savage swipes from something immensely powerful. But no animal I knew could wreak such havoc without leaving behind more of a trace, more evidence of its being. The forest hummed with life, mocking me with normalcy as I followed whatever trail I could discern. Calls for backup met only static. Whether it was something wrong with my radio or the impossibly thick canopy above, help wasn't coming soon. Then, amidst the dense brush and towering pines, something moved with a grace that shouldn't have belonged to its grotesque form. It peeked through foliage briefly skin mottled like decaying bark and limbs too elongated to be human lurched away from me in silence. I pursued cautiously but doggedly. This could be our culprit, or our only lead to those missing souls. It was my duty as much as it was instinctual need for answers. Thoughts raced but none reached a conclusion. This wasn't an animal, or a person. I could articulate neither what it was nor where it came from. A scream broke my focus, a sound so human, so filled with terror it rooted me to the spot. Ahead lay one of the girls with clothes torn and eyes wide with fear too primal for her young age. She clutched at me like I was her lifeline as she pointed trembling fingers toward where whatever it was had retreated. Then darkness swooped down upon us, as if night fell in haste, and within these new shadows around us stirred restlessness, shapes shifting just beyond reach or sight a panorama of silent watchers whose intentions we couldn't begin to guess. I held the girl close, scanning the surroundings, understanding she could not be left alone. The creature's disappearance into the forest had not eased the tension in my muscles, nor the resolve to protect. I could not call for help, my radio useless against whatever force dampened its signal here. The forest grew quiet, unnatural hush replaced paired calls of wildlife. I moved us toward an open space, limiting ways something might approach unseen. I keyed my radio again, hoping for a crackle of life from it. Nothing. Out there, something stirred, massive form shadowed by trees. It towered over us, body a mass of twisted limbs that shouldn't support the weight they did. I sunk deep into a mottled face that merged patterns of bark and flesh. It moved closer, indifferent to our presence yet menacing in its silent approach. The girl clung tighter. My own hands reached for the pistol at my hip, not to fight it but to give us a chance. A gunshot might buy time to escape or signal others if heard. Yet it did not attack. It watched us with an intelligence that suggested it understood more than any animal should. I fired a shot into the air. The creature recoiled but did not flee. We backed away, making for the edge of the forest as steadily as we could without turning our backs on it. Dawn came with no sign of pursuit. The creature vanished as surely as it appeared. We reached the town by daybreak. I handed the girl to her parents and relayed what happened without embellishment, or guess at what hunted us. That night I returned with others armed and ready for conflict, but we found no track nor sign of such a being ever walking through those woods. Days passed with no incident. Some searched while others speculated. Was this an undiscovered species? A phenomenon defying explanation? One fact became inevitable. We never saw it again. Those lost were recalled with sorrow as unsolved disappearances, except one survivor whose life I held together in those quiet, terrifying hours before dawn broke upon us once more.
I always prided myself on my sense of direction, never once getting lost in the woods. My name is Ezekiel Brandt, a park ranger at Shenandoah National Park. The miles of undeveloped forest offered solace from the city's chaos. No GPS signal needed. I knew these trails like the back of my hand, could navigate them blind. Then came the day that shook my world. While patrolling near a remote section by Old Rag Mountain, I stumbled upon an unfamiliar clearing. It was as if the earth had swallowed a chunk of forest whole. In the center lay an array of personal items, wallets, watches, even a pair of glasses neatly folded atop a doggered book. No sign explained their owner's absence. A chill ran through me despite the warmth of the afternoon sun. For years, I'd heard tales from hikers about strange happenings, shadows moving just beyond the inexplicable cold spots amongst the trees. I'd dismissed them as fables till now. Hours passed while I radioed in my findings and awaited instructions. The sun dipped low when crackling through my walkie-talkie came confirmation of a missing persons report Franklin Teague had vanished from these woods two days prior. Armed with this knowledge and an unsettled feeling that tugged at my core, I set off. The search for Franklin took me deeper into the woods than normal protocol would suggest. Something powerful compelled me forward logic perhaps cast aside by curiosity or duty. As night descended and visibility diminished to near blindness under thick canopies, I realized that for once, I didn't know where I was. Panic rose but was quickly quelled losing composure wasn't an option. My only companion was the elusive half-light provided by my flashlight's dying batteries when it happened, movement ahead, quick and quiet against the forest backdrop. In vain, I tried to catch a glimpse of what lurked just beyond reach. Then silence fell thick with tormenting anticipation. Gun drawn now, not standard issue but something I always carried— you see things out here that city folk wouldn't believe. I proceeded with caution. The rustling returned but closer this time, sending vibrations through the forest floor and reverberating against my boots' soles. Leaves shuffled, branches snapped under immense weight, whatever it was getting nearer by every heartbeat. I could hear it breathe, a guttural pant hinting at sighs and malice born from nature's dark embrace. And then there was light, not mine, bioluminescent eyes piercing through shadow cast by its enormous form as it stepped into view. Higher than any creature had any right to be, multiple stories tall if placed against a building with hind limbs powerful enough to pulverize stone and front limbs ending in malformed appendages akin to hands sculpted for destruction rather than any tender purpose. I dared breathe only when it did— this beast cloaked in Shenandoah's inky night, as it weighed my worth or marked me prey, its ghastly visage inches from mine though separated by darkness thickened with threat. The beast towered, a presence both alien and ancient. Its breath came in thick gusts, a stench of decay. Bristled fur lined its flanks, damp with the forest's breath. Eyes shone with their own light, two orbs set in a skull that might have been canine or bear-like, yet neither. I backed away, hands trembling despite a career in law enforcement that taught me control. The creature advanced with intent clear in each deliberate step. It raised one massive limb, claws unfurled. I had neither the will nor the delusion to think my gun would save me now. No cry for help left my lips. A stark understanding gripped me. The radio signal didn't reach these depths of wild terrain. Nor would backup arrive in time. This was a battle measured in seconds, not the hours help would require. Without warning, pain erupted as claws raked across my side. Cloth and skin tore with equal ease. Blood seeped into fabric already damp with sweat and fear. I staggered instinctively feeling for open flesh that now marred my torso. 
flight overtook any semblance of fight left within me. I ran, navigating roots and underbrush with a desperate speed born from survival's demand. Behind me, crashes told of pursuit unyielding. My truck sat where I left it by the trailhead, deceptively calm, keys still in ignition where haste had left them. I drove recklessly over pathways meant for slower travel until lights of the nearest hospital came into view. Police took my statement. Words like, animal attack, were thrown about but none that fit what lay etched into my memory. Doctors stitched closed deep gashes while officers spoke of rangers searching woods for an unlikely predator they wouldn't find. Days passed from incident to recovery to return to duty. Whispers about what happened grew hushed around me. Some spoke of bears grown bold, others of backwoods meth labs guarded by men who dress wounds to maintain silence rather than see authorities involved. I know what I saw defied easy explanation or belief and so my account was simple, attacked by unidentified wildlife during routine patrol, assailant remains at large. I returned to patrol with scars hidden beneath uniform and a prudence newly instilled at each shadow turn or unknown rustle within depths of Shenandoah's embrace. The flashlight's beam cut through nights darker now than before, but unwavering all the same. For what hides may be mysteries beyond our ken or simply reflections of nature we've yet to understand. What I do know is survival sometimes hinges not on confronting what hunts us but on our ability to endure and continue despite fears unknown and unintelligible to all but those who face them. Every job has its downside, but when you're sworn to secrecy by the U.S. government, Dealing with the unknown becomes just another part of your daily grind. I work at a secluded facility deep in the forests of Oregon off the books and miles from any prying eyes. We deal with stuff that would give most people nightmares. But it's just research, right? At least, that's what I told myself every morning. My colleague, Mervyn Schumacher, was a wiry man with more brains than anyone would need in two lifetimes. As we clocked into the lab that morning a cluster of hidden buildings camouflaged by thick undergrowth and ancient trees there was chatter about unusual readings from our latest genetic experiment. Probably mice again, Mervyn said with a half-hearted chuckle as we descended into the belly of our concrete-laden behemoth. But it wasn't mice and the foundation of that realization shook us to our core. In one of the lockdown chambers, where we kept our more volatile subjects, we found Harlan Dotrice, another researcher, or what was left of him plastered against the glass like some grotesque human splotch art. There were no lacerations, just an eerie, bulging distortion of his body as if every bone had been crushed simultaneously. With guns at our hips, training drilled into us for emergencies, Mervyn and I cautiously surveyed each corridor. Every protocol pointed to containment breach. But curiously enough, all systems were green across the board. This gruesome sight was an anomaly, a solitary incident void of explanation. Harlan's demise had no witnesses. Even the high-definition security cameras failed to capture his final moments, a first in my line of work. As day edged towards dark without notice due to our skyless surroundings, our radios buzzed frantic calls for help that punctuated the stillness, but they cut off abruptly before we could pinpoint their location or identity. Protocol would say call it in, yet this didn't sit within normal bounds. No one knew how to deal with this mess absolutely submerged in ambiguity. So Mervyn and I pressed on into unknown territory, fear beneath our facades as palpable as the damp chill that seeped through our lab coats. Out there in darkness aided only by sporadic flickers of fluorescent lights, words were exchanged with rational detachment concealing panic-stricken impulses. Mervyn, we should backtrack. 
I suggested. He nodded without pretense, agreed, revealing nothing more. Progressing deeper into unfamiliar sectors shrouded in heavy silence seemed ludicrous yet compulsory. It was deserted yet furnished with anticipatory dread that clung like cobwebs very much alive with potential menace. Here is where my skepticism usually thrived. However, it lay dormant beneath rising alarms snaking up my spine quite tangibly. A storm warned us outside with wind howling like tortured souls past reinforced windows and ironic choir to our predicament, and reminder that nature still commanded respect even if man meddled untamed within her bosom. Then without ceremony or prelude there it stood amidst clutter of overturned equipment, its eyes glinted wetly in stray beams boring down from above, reflecting nothing human nor recognizable from lore cocooned within my rational mind where such knowledge rested untouched till then. Mervyn's gasp barely overshadowed by costly equipment clattering unsettlingly close provided backing vocals. No joke lined his lips now nor attempted gallows humor, a departure from his baseline. It moved quickly for something so vividly reminiscent of folkloric beasts, yet no fawn-footed nimble creature this. Its steps thudded deliberate resonating through chill air. Its bulk shaded ambiguously any definition lent fleeting consideration outright dismissed as impossible, non-existent except, here before me persisted tangible although desired otherwise fervently within heartbeats I willed silent unheeded. I turned and ran. Mervyn followed. The creature charged, a mass of fur and rage chasing us through the labyrinth of our own making. Its arms were too long, torso rippling with muscle, claws scraping the ground with each step it took. We raced through corridors, the sound of our breath loud in our ears. Doors we passed, potential salvation, were ignored. The need to put distance between us and the thing was all-consuming. We reached the emergency exit, nearly faltering in our haste. I shoved the door open, half expecting it to be locked. It wasn't. Outside, we found ourselves in an alley, lit only by the distant glow of street lamps. We could hear it inside, thrashing, searching. Why not call for help? Our phones lay forgotten, somewhere back there on workbenches cluttered with research on genetic mutations, none predicting this outcome. Mervyn pointed to a fire escape ladder hanging just within our reach. The decision was made without words. We climbed into the bleak refuge of night. Hours passed or maybe minutes. Time lost its meaning as we waited, hardly daring to breathe. Eventually, dawn crept over the cityscape and with it came silence from within the building below. We descended warily back into the alley. No sign existed of the previous night's creature other than talon-like gouges in the metal doors where we had exited. We had no plan but knew we couldn't return inside. Whatever that thing was, mutated experiment gone as wrong as possible, or a primal fear granted flesh, mattered little. Survival was now about daylight and open spaces. Mervyn suggested railroad tracks at the city's edge as a means to navigate unseen, unsure of what else to do but keep moving, avoid exposure. The tracks led us to parts of town where people prefer not to notice, lest they become part of another's problems. There we hid during daylight hours, moving only when night granted us obscurity. Then news started trickling in. Reports from nighttime workers about something violent tearing through outskirts neighborhoods prompted whispers of predators, both animal and human, but never touched reality. Eventually, we heard it no more. Either it had moved on or found solitude somewhere among collapsed structures that echoed its harsh origins better than humanity ever could. We remain wary still. Every shadow a reminder that life can shift to survival in a heartbeat span. 
and somewhere out there lies proof that things can exist beyond our understanding or control which speaks to some deep-seated fear that begs no further investigation on my part. That hulking aberration remains at large. Perhaps another will fall victim or maybe no more will come from uncharted genetic territories for now, its origins and fate unknown except by those who were there and prefer silence over memory recall. Anyone who has ever driven through the backwoods of Oregon knows the kind of quiet that presses in on your ears. There's inevitably a moment where you become keenly aware that you're an outsider, an interloper in a land of towering firs and whispering winds. It was during such a drive that my grip tightened on the steering wheel, not out of fear, but respect for the serenity that surrounded me. I am an operative for an undisclosed government agency dedicated to the science others dare not contemplate. My mundane alibi was being a wildlife biologist. My true vocation was far from it. Seated next to me in the government-issued SUV was Dr. Artemis Nolan, a geneticist with more degrees than a thermometer, and our field tech, Bothackery, a man more at home in these woods than in his own living room. Our destination was clandestine, buried within Oregon's sprawling forests, a facility where genetic boundaries were tested and often crossed. Approaching our destination just as twilight softened the harsh lines of the wilderness, Bo remarked. You ever notice how trees are like silent sentinels? Probably seen more history than we could ever dig up. We chuckled and engaged in light banter until we reached our outposts a secure cabin equipped with labs antithetical to its rustic exterior. We began unpacking gear when Bo froze, squinting towards the thick tree line as silence engulfed us. What's wrong? queried Artemis. Thought I saw. Bo murmured before pausing abruptly. You thought you saw what? Artemis prodded further. Never mind. He muttered but remained watchful. Two days into our experiments we already had promising data. But nature had its way of reminding us that not all variables can be controlled or predicted. On this third morning, I discovered our perimeter fence shredded apart, not cut or torn by machinery, but peeled back like the skin of an orange. What could do this remained veiled in shadows. We've got trespassers, Artemis suggested though her voice lacked conviction. I'll scan the perimeter, Bo declared, hauling his rifle over his shoulder with practiced ease. Hours waned with no word from him. We attempted calling for help but found all communications dead, satellite phone, radios. Nothing connected us to the world beyond these trees. There were tracks, I said flatly when Artemis asked why I hadn't radioed for support. What kind? None that should exist, I replied cryptically. The day aged into dusk as I patrolled near the damaged site with my own rifle slung across my chest, an intimate weight heavy with potential violence. All this technology at our fingertips and we're still just primordial hunters at heart. Artemis half-joked beside me. That's one way to see it. I concurred with wry amusement lacing my tone. Night claimed dominion over the sky when we heard it, a strange shuffle unmistakably close yet shrouded by darkness. Without warning, something immense barreled out between trees towards us, fast and primal in movement. A bear? Artemis gasped. No bear runs like that. Mere glimpses revealed abhorrent distortions of fur or scales or maybe both, veiling muscle and sinew built for predation and fury. Its form was eldritch and undeniably real as it paced before us, a guardian or executioner of these ancient woods. It didn't make sounds like any creature known to man, not a snarl or growl but an alien vibration that stirred leaves and rattled our bones. 
Dr. Helix, came a voice through rustling foliage. It was Bo staggering towards us through bushes and brambles bleeding from numerous gashes. There's more than one, he choked out amid labored breaths. Artemis trained her gun on anything that moved while castigating herself for never believing her folklorist sister who whispered legends into her childhood nights. Fables now seemed prophetic nightmares made flesh before our eyes. I reached for my phone. The screen cracked and faint. Service was non-existent here, out of range. The woods seemed to swallow the signal before it even had the chance to escape. Run, I mouthed, not daring to raise my voice above a whisper. Artemis nodded, pulling Bo up by his arm, his labored breaths now louder in the chilling silence as the creature circled us. We ran. I didn't look back. I could hear the thing tearing through the brush behind us, each thunderous step a promise of violence. We stumbled into a clearing. Artemis and Bo collapsed beside me, heaving breaths tore through the quiet night. Then it emerged at the edge of the woods, tall and hunched, scales catching moonlight, wet fur clinging to shifted plates like a grotesque suit of armor from nature's darkest armory. It hesitated, eyes glowing with malevolent intelligence. It charged again, and we scrambled desperately away. Artemis fired shots that rang out like futile cries against the hurricane's howl. They did nothing to slow it. Hours must have passed, a relentless chase until we saw lights, campers likely unaware of the horrors lurking in their periphery. We broke through into another clearing, campfires lit, and tents pitched. A woman looked up from where she'd been sitting by the fire. Panic crossed her face as she took in our disheveled appearance and Bo's injuries. Please, I gasped out between breaths. Help us. She was quick despite her shock. Her companions surged up too, offering aid while confusion still marred their features. As they tended to Bo's wounds and called for emergency services on their satellite phone, I scanned the trees half expecting those illuminated orbs to pierce through the gloom again. Somehow we'd gotten lucky. Civilization had deterred our pursuer if only for a moment. The first responders were efficient. Soon, rangers scoured the area with dogs that picked up nothing but confusion from their handlers' cues. There was talk of an escaped exotic animal, some illegal pet gone feral, but nothing conclusive came from their search. Weeks turned into months with no further incidents reported or evidence found that corroborated our story. It baffled authorities and left locals whispering rumors about ghost stories and campfire legends that grew more absurd with each telling. What lived in those woods remained an enigma shrouded in natural camouflage, or perhaps something more cunning than wildlife biologists could catalog with their meticulous branch of science. Bo recovered physically but never returned to those woods for his botanical studies. None of U.S. did. The forest kept its secrets hidden beneath miles of unmarked terrain where soft moss might still hold impressions of our frenzied flight or be refreshed by other narratives yet unplayed in that hazy boundary between animalistic horror and human fragility. From then on, my head instinctively turned toward forests with uneasy respect for all that is unseen within their dense embrace, cautionary tales no longer relegated to fables but etched into memory with visceral certainty. It was around sunrise when I, Arlo Hutchins, arrived at the trailhead in the remote northern reaches of the Gila National Forest in New Mexico. The air was crisp with the first hints of fall. As an experienced search and rescue officer for the United States Forest Service, it was my job to find and safely bring back missing individuals within this vast wilderness. A small group of worried folks had gathered at the mouth of the trail 
eagerly awaiting any news about their friends who'd gone missing while hiking in these woods two days prior. Few people ventured into this isolated region, so locals referred to it as the Devil's Playground. I listened intently as some fellow officers briefed me on what they'd learned so far before beginning my search. Cracking a friendly joke about needing more coffee, I set out along the trail. After a few hours of steady hiking and climbing, I found myself deeply immersed in nature's splendor. Dense trees provided much-needed shade from the sun as birdsong filled my ears. The peace was shattered suddenly by an alarming discovery, a campsite abandoned in disarray. Upon closer examination, there were signs of a struggle, broken branches, torn tents, blood spatters on rocks, implying violence had occurred here. A wave of dread washed over me as I realized the gravity of the situation. Cautiously moving ahead, I approached what appeared to be another clue in the form of deep claw marks running down a tree alongside large paw prints embedded in soft earth. This unknown creature was certainly no ordinary predator one might encounter in these woods. The further into the dense foliage I went, the more unsettling evidence appeared. Tattered clothing snagged on thorny bushes, scraps of food littered around with large bite marks. With each step towards my new objective, to identify this creature that had inflicted so much pain and fear, my determination only grew stronger despite its inherent dangers. As the sun dipped lower into the sky, I found myself in a clearing filled with gnarled trees. A sudden and unfamiliar sound a guttural growl pierced the otherwise serene scene. My adrenaline spiked as I felt invisible eyes watching me from among the shadows. The creature appeared with startling speed, seamless and silent as it moved. Suddenly within striking range, it reared up to reveal its full terrifying appearance. A massive creature, part beast and part human, with sharp claws and teeth protruding from its grotesque mouth. I hastily aimed my gun at the monster's twisting form fingers itching to pull the trigger. The creature emitted another guttural growl before lunging towards me, its intentions clearly murderous. There are more of them. One of my fellow officers shouted from behind me just in time to warn me. Sure enough, several similar creatures emerged from the dark forest depths. In the face of such monstrous adversaries, survival instincts kicked in. I only had one option run and call for help simultaneously. As I sprinted away from the creatures, stumbling over roots and dodging branches, I fumbled for my radio and screamed into it, informing my fellow officers of our location and the imminent danger we faced. Out of breath and terrified, I looked back to see that the other officers had followed suit, running in different directions to scatter the creatures' attention. The gruesome beasts gave chase, their unnerving growls echoing through the forest as they pursued us relentlessly. I dashed into a cave-like hiding spot between two large rocks, pressing my back against the damp stone to stay hidden. My heart pounded in my chest so loudly I feared the creatures would hear it from a distance. The agonizing screams of my fellow officer pierced the air, indicating they weren't so lucky in evading our pursuers. The sound of heavy breathing drew nearer. One of the monstrous creatures was sniffing around impatiently for its next victim, me. As it approached the entrance of my makeshift hideaway, unsure if I was inside or not, I silently prayed for a miracle. And then it happened a helicopter appeared overhead muttering thuds as it descended upon us. The powerful rotors blew leaves away from its path its strong lights penetrating through the darkened forest. It seemed like backup had arrived just in time. The fearsome creature retreated at once, taken aback by this sudden and unexpected development affording me just enough time to make a break for it. My legs carried me forward with renewed vigor as I heard more helicopters and sirens approaching from afar, indicating that even more reinforcements were on their way. 
As law enforcement officers from various departments converged on our location in both ground units and via air support, a chaotic battle commenced with monstrous creatures. Their grotesque forms writhed and roared in a desperate attempt to not be subdued, but the combined force of our officers eventually overwhelmed them. Once the last of the beasts had been killed or captured, the forest abruptly fell silent. The aftermath was a grim sight, torn clothing and blood-stained soil serving as testament to the horror that had taken place on this otherwise unremarkable day. Adding to the melancholic scene, a few of my fellow officers lay deceased, victims claimed by these chilling adversaries in a most gruesome manner. With heavy hearts, we gathered together to pay tribute to our fallen comrades and to recognize their sacrifices. As they were taken away by medical teams and our grief-fueled thoughts of anger against these unidentified creatures, an unspoken question lingered. Where did they come from? The following days brought insightful investigations, the creatures' origins slowly being unveiled as we pieced together their history. Though rumors of government experiments circled amongst the officers, no definitive answer could be found. Returning home days later, covered in bruises and cuts but ultimately alive, I couldn't help but reflect on the events that had transpired. That harrowing day would remain etched into my memory for years to come, a stark reminder of the horrifying enemies we might still face lurking within any dark and shadowy corner. Though we were unable to provide a proper identity to these grotesque, deadly beings or fully understand their motivations for wreaking such havoc in our world, one fact was certain my life would never quite be the same again. With every creak in my house or rustle of leaves outside at night, I would be reminded of that forest and those terrifying monsters of unknown origin. For now, though still haunted by memories of what occurred in that seemingly ordinary stretch of dense woodland with its gnarled trees and claw-marked signs of struggle, we had at least survived collectively, and in doing so, discovered within ourselves a strength and determination we may never have realized we possessed. I was driving down an isolated road, somewhere in Wyoming, trying to get a break from work. I jokingly said to myself, I guess this beats being stuck behind a desk, huh? Marvelous mountains and vast valleys stretched out on both sides of the road. I'd been driving for hours, and the sun was setting behind the peaks in a spectacular display of colors. As night fell, I flicked on my car's headlights. There was something ominous about these rocky roads after sundown. Just as I passed a sign announcing that I was now in the Bridger Teton National Forest, a sudden downpour started to hammer against the windshield. I checked the map on my phone and realized that there were barely any towns or settlements around. My name is Talbert Hoskins, and if you've ever heard stories about getting lost in the woods in remote regions of America— you know that this wasn't exactly a good place to be. Figuring that it was better to be safe than sorry, I decided to pull over into a small rest stop for shelter from the storm. The rain was unforgiving and brutal, leaving me no choice but to spend the night in my car. It seemed like nature had other plans for me when I heard a faint distress call coming from the forest's edge. At this point, one's first instinct would be to stay put or call for help, but with no phone signal nor any soul around for miles, my compassionate nature took over. Fighting off fear and worry, laced with occasional humor of what awaited me at home, I grabbed my flashlight and mustered up courage as I ventured into the shroud of darkness under twisted branches from towering trees which seemed alive, ready to lunge at any moment. On my way through this damp, wild world, I stumbled across a gruesome sight in the form of what looked like mutilated animal remains. It was as if something snacked on it and left the leftovers scattered around. I noticed some prints in the wet soil. Deer? Elk? They were large and didn't quite seem right. 
With growing unease, I followed the faint cries deeper into the woods, parting curtains of foliage into a clearing. Huddled against a tree, I found a woman, bruised and shivering. My name's Talbert Hoskins, I told her gently, urging her to come with me. During our trek back to the car, she hesitantly shared her experience about running into that twisted creature, which nobody knew with certainty what it was, and detailed its appearance. She spoke of its tall, lanky frame with elongated limbs, and how its head looked like a deer or stag skull with sharp antlers. As we approached the car, I heard branches snap somewhere behind us. Now alert, I prepared myself mentally for an unexpected showdown. Pulling out my gun from the back seat, I reassured the injured woman that we would be safe. Suddenly, like a manifestation of pure dread, it appeared in our erratic flashlight beam, that grotesque, antlered being stood not far from where we now huddled inside my car. Without time to pause for disbelief or ponder its origin, I aimed at it but never got a shot off as its menacing gaze bore down upon us with terrifying authority. We watched as this unspeakable terror continued to stalk around our makeshift sanctuary, each movement seemingly deliberate and calculated to find weak points or even provoke a fleeing response from either of us in that confined space. Time seemed to hang suspended in an endless loop. We eventually lost sight of our pursuer. This was not relief in itself. No triumph came easy facing that faceless abomination, but rather a leap into unknown territory where caution had to be constantly negotiated against palpable fear coursing through every nerve fiber. Amidst it all, I whispered reassuring words to the traumatized woman while remaining laser-focused on our ever-narrowing options. Ever more desperate for help, I picked up my phone and tried dialing for assistance. My fingers trembled as I punched in the numbers, heart pounding in my ears as though it would burst out of my chest any moment. But I was met with a busy signal. I cursed at our unbelievably bad fortune. We were alone in facing this depraved creature. The injured woman whispered that we should find a way to lock the car doors. Without hesitation, we locked every door and closed every window tight, hoping that the beast wouldn't be able to breach our weak defenses. We held our breaths in anticipation of its next move. Eyes darting back and forth between each window, I tried to spot the creature lurking nearby. Everything looked eerily still outside, but there was no sign of it having retreated into the darkness either. The quiet moments that followed were nerve-wracking, a haphazard tension punctuated only by the occasional grunt or rustle from within the car. Suddenly, a deafening screech of metal against metal rent the air as sharp and the like claws tore through one of the car doors, mere inches from where the injured woman sat. Reflexively, she screamed at the terrifying attack, her eyes shut tight against impending doom. I jerked at both steering wheel and ignition key, praying that we'd somehow manage to leave this nightmare behind with each turn of the tires. The engine roared to life and with tires squealing, we lurched forward away from our attacker. Risking a glimpse behind us revealed an image of horror. The creature had torn open an entire side of my car with its razor-sharp antlers, but still stood rooted to its spot. Its wicked expression seemed to suggest it had derived some sick pleasure from inflicting pain and fear upon us. Unanswered questions about its origin not further inside me, but now was not the time for curiosity. T thank you, whispered the injured woman, her voice trembling. You saved my life. It took every ounce of self-control to keep my hands steady on the wheel and not falter in our escape. We're not out of this yet, I muttered, focusing on the road ahead. We pushed forward into the night, unsure of where to go, but unwilling to stay another moment in that forsaken place. The small town nearby offered some semblance of safety. Perhaps there someone would believe our bizarre encounter and be able to do something. With rescue still out of reach thanks to patchy phone signals, we clung to frayed hope tightly as we could. 
Reaching the town, we sought refuge in a makeshift first aid center run by local volunteers. There, the injured woman received much-needed medical attention and began recovering from her ordeal. We recounted our harrowing experience to incredulous ears and watched their faces become ashen with dread. Days went by as we tried to piece together some semblance of normalcy amidst shaken nerves and heightened senses. Gratitude abounded from townspeople and victim alike for my part in fleeing that horror. But I couldn't shake the suspicion that despite our momentary escape, that creature might still be out there waiting for its next prey while lurking just beyond human sight. In time, some townsfolk came forward with new information, a man who had witnessed similar horrific creatures in the past but chose silence over ridicule. Shared experiences gradually built a solidarity stronger than fear, and although no answers ever surfaced for the creature's existence or origin, its victims found solace knowing they were not alone. As weeks turned into months and then drifted slowly through years, the once unthinkable encounter with that antlered beast began fading into whispers of lore amongst those who had been affected directly or indirectly by its gruesome attacks. Tales of survival earned weight among locals, steadfastly refusing to fade into obscurity like some mere campfire story. That night's events shall remain forever etched in mind and memory for it was then I glimpsed a terror more sinister than any figment of the human imagination. It was then I sensed the eerie potential that lay within those shadowed spaces betwixt life and death, where unnameable, unspeakable things fester, waiting for the right moment to strike. It all started when Frank Kilmer invited me to his secluded cabin in the woods of Big Bear, California. I found something you just have to see, he said, and that was all it took to pique my curiosity. So there I was, guiding my rental car along the winding mountain roads. Frank Kilmer, I muttered to myself. It had been years since we last spoke and I was curious about what he found so important that it warranted an impromptu trip. When I arrived, Frank immediately led me to a concealed cave near his cabin. As we reached it, I felt a chill run down my spine even though the sun bore down heavily upon us both. You'll never guess what I unearthed here, Frank said, a sparkle in his eyes. His excitement was contagious as we crouched to enter the cave's narrow entrance. Inside, after turning on our flashlights, I stared at the strange markings etched into the stone walls. They formed a rather bizarre pattern which appeared to be ancient and possibly even tribal. So, is this why you called me up here? I asked Frank. He grinned back at me. Nope. What I wanted you to see is this. He pointed toward an odd-looking metallic object half-buried in the dirt. What is that? I asked as we both studied it closely. No idea, Frank replied nonchalantly as he carefully dug around it with his pocket knife. All of a sudden, we heard crunching footsteps approaching outside the cave. My heart raced as adrenaline kicked in. Who's there? shouted Frank, standing tall and defensive near the entrance. The footsteps halted for a moment but then resumed coming closer. That was when we saw it an abomination of a creature with elongated limbs and bone-like antlers sprouting from its dear skull. It gazed at us with lifeless, hollow eyes and an unmistakable hunger. Good God, I whispered, grabbing a sizable rock as a makeshift weapon. Frank took a step back, positioning himself next to me. What do you think that is? Don't know he replied, his voice shaking. But we must defend ourselves. The creature's unnervingly long limbs slowly moved it forward into the cave. Frantically, I racked my brain for some kind of battle strategy but struggled to come up with one as the seconds ticked down and the grotesque creature crept closer, filling the dim cavern with the stench of decay. Can we call for help? 
I asked just above a whisper. No signal out here, he replied with resignation. I prepared myself for the inevitable attack. Just as we readied our makeshift weapons, Frank glanced over at me and forced out a chuckle. I always wanted to ask, did you hear about the claustrophobic astronaut? He inquired, attempting to inject some humor into the dire situation. No, I replied with a weak smile, my hands gripping onto the sharp edge rock even tighter. He just needed a little more space, Frank muttered. His attempt at levity was certainly appreciated, but our focus quickly returned to the incoming threat. The monstrous creature advanced further into the cave, saliva dripping from its exposed jawbone. We mirrored its movements, slowly circling around it while keeping our distance. Its hunting tactics were unsettlingly smart, but its apparent intelligence made it all the more terrifying. As the creature closed in on us, Frank and I continued to circle it. It didn't seem to have a weak spot, at least not one that we could identify. My heart pounded in my chest, and my sweaty palms made it difficult to keep a firm grip on the rock. Frank! The ceiling! I shouted, pointing to the loose rocks above the creature. He gave me a nod of understanding. We both hurled our makeshift weapons at the weak-looking section of the rocky ceiling above the creature, hoping to weaken it enough to trigger a minor cave-in. Some of the debris struck the creature, and its elongated limbs flailed, trying to regain balance. But it wasn't enough. Instead of collapsing, more rocks merely dislodged from the ceiling and landed around it. Our failed attempt only seemed to anger the creature more. It lunged at Frank with its terrifying jawbone and sharp antlers, catching him off guard. The impact threw him against the cave wall with a sickening crunch. Frank! I screamed in horror as he fell limp at my feet. The creature let out a guttural sound in satisfaction before turning its attention back towards me. Desperate and cornered, I ran deeper into the cave hoping that maybe something would present itself as salvation. As luck would have it, or perhaps out of sheer desperation, I spotted narrow cracks in a section of the cave wall ahead. I squeezed myself into one of them, praying that a human wouldn't fit. The creature snarled upon seeing me slip into hiding and lunged toward me once more. Surprisingly, in its haste and determination to reach me, its powerful limbs collided head-on with the cave wall instead. There was a loud crash and an ear-splitting shriek from our pursuer. Stunned and injured from impact, it writhed in pain, limbs convulsing on the rocky ground. Now was my chance. With adrenaline coursing through me, I scrambled out of my hiding spot and sprinted toward the cave entrance. I knew that I couldn't defeat this monstrous creature single-handedly, but I hoped to make it back to town and rally others for help. As I stumbled out, gasping for breath, the creature's agonized scream echoed through the cave behind me. It may have lost its prey for now, but knowing such an abomination existed in our world filled me with dread. We needed to be prepared, for we faced something beyond our understanding. Finding the strength from deep within, I ran towards the town, tearing through branches and over rocky terrain. Had Frank not tried to lighten the mood earlier, he would still be alive. How many more lives would be lost? That horrific thought urged me to press on. The townspeople seemed shocked and frightened by my appearance and frantic explanations of what had happened in the cave. Nevertheless, they gathered themselves and headed out to rescue Frank if he was still alive or at least recover his body. Hours later, we stood somberly around Frank's grave as the last shovel of dirt fell onto his casket. It was a grim reminder that his wit and bravery had been snuffed out by something we had never seen before. How would we live knowing this terror haunted our land? No one knew what the next steps were or if there was any way to vanquish such malevolence. For now, 
we banded together and placed every bit of our hope in finding a way to protect ourselves from that sinister creature, to escape or ultimately stop it from hurting anyone else ever again. In memory of Frank's courageous spirit, we pressed forward into an uncertain future haunted by long limbs and exposed jawbones within dark caves, an image that would haunt us indefinitely. I had always dreamt of visiting the Grand Canyon, and finally I made it. My name is Jerome Blackwood, and this was supposed to be the adventure of a lifetime. Little did I know that I was about to become entangled in something far beyond my comprehension. After a long day of hiking, I was ready for some rest and relaxation in my modest cabin. But during dinner at the local eatery, something caught my attention. A man nearby was talking in hushed tones with his friend. They spoke of unusual occurrences happening recently, with animals being found brutally mutilated, showing signs of gnashing and tearing. I brushed it off as mere gossip, but my curiosity had been piqued. The next day, I decided to hike in a more remote area than the previous day. As I traversed deeper into the desolate landscape, I stumbled across a gruesome sight, a torn carcass of an elk, its entrails spilled across the dusty earth. On closer inspection, I could see bite marks from large fangs or claws on the poor animal's flesh. Feeling uneasy but skeptical about what could have caused this mutilation, I turned back to warn others about what I had found. Along the way, I came across a group of fellow hikers who shared their experiences of seeing unknown tracks and noticing bizarre movements in the shadows. We agreed to report our findings together. As we spoke to park authorities about our gruesome discoveries and rumors swirling around town, they remained largely mute on the topic. Seemingly unconcerned or even dismissive towards our concerns, they offered no insight or assistance. Our growing uneasiness led to a night spent debating over campfires what creature or force could be responsible for such unsettling events. With so many diverse backgrounds represented among us, from biology majors to retired law enforcement officers, we attempted piecing together what little information we had collected. On the third day, our group trekked towards the site where I had initially found the mangled elk. We needed to uncover more concrete evidence to validate our theories. The further we ventured, the more the ominous atmosphere took hold of us. I caught myself constantly looking over my shoulder, convinced I saw movement on the edges of my vision. Later that afternoon, a blood-curdling scream pierced through the cold air. We sprinted towards the sound to find one of our fellow hikers cowering in fear before something I never thought possible. The beast was enormous, towering over us with thick, matted fur covering its gigantic frame, emitting a nauseating stench unlike anything I had ever experienced. Its feral eyes reflected a malevolent intelligence that seemed incongruous with its vicious animalistic demeanor. Before we could react— it lunged at one of our own, a biologist named Wallace O'Connell. Panic coursed through my veins as I watched him being lifted off his feet and bitten in half by this monstrosity. Despite our unpreparedness and undeniable dread, we fought back using hiking poles as crude weapons to deter the creature long enough for the rest of us to put some distance between ourselves and this incomprehensible adversary. We knew there was no time to call for help, no chance of saving our friend who had already perished beneath the salivating maw of this grotesque horror. As we fled for our lives, abandoning everything we had carried on our journey, including any hope of understanding what had just transpired, it became abundantly clear that we were no longer hunters attempting to glean knowledge from an inexplicable series of events we were now prey fighting for survival against a living nightmare. 
The creature relentlessly pursued us through canyons and ravines as our bodies neared exhaustion while adrenaline struggled to overcome fatigue. Our group beset by fear and despair began arguing over whether to stand our ground or push forward our luck. My eyes met the cold gaze of a retired police officer, Amanda Daniels, whose trembling hand held a handgun, poorly concealed in panic-stricken grip. With all semblance of reason disintegrated, Amanda took the lead while the rest of us followed suit. A heart-wrenching feeling overcome me while racing away from that terror just beyond the boundaries of my peripheral vision. Desperation electrified the air as we tried to maintain coherence long enough to hatch a plan. The unimaginable had happened, and our lives were now at the mercy of this menacing beast. Amanda, clearly disturbed by the sight before us, tried to summon help through her smartphone. Unfortunately, cell phone reception was non-existent in these desolate lands. Our limited knowledge of folklore offered no solutions, leaving us in an abyss of uncertainty. We continued onward, driven by the instinctual need for self-preservation. The creature stalking our every move was relentless in its pursuit. Its massive, twisted body left a destructive path trail markers and signs of our previous exploration lay shredded on the ground. The sheer terror that coursed through our veins fueled our determination to escape this nightmare. As we scrambled over rocks and through overgrown vegetation, each of us clung to a thread of hope that we might eventually find safety. For hours this ordeal continued until finally, exhausted and battered by the chase, we stumbled upon an unconventional refuge, an abandoned cabin hidden amid dense shrubbery. Seizing the opportunity that presented itself, we scrambled inside and secured every possible entrance against potential intrusion. Once reassured that we were as safe as possible given the circumstances, I turned my attention toward finding any means of communication within the cabin. Buried beneath a pile of weathered books and binders was a well-worn radio transmitter. The concept seemed archaic but offered some glimmer of possibility for rescue. I fiddled with the knobs to send out a distress signal when suddenly, a familiar voice pierced through the static, Simon Patel, our group's resident wildlife photographer. Shockingly, he informed us that he had managed to narrowly escape his encounter with the creature before it attacked us, taking refuge in a dense thicket when hope seemed lost. His escape had led him to stumble upon a small settlement down the canyon, home to an eccentric hermit with knowledge of local legends and creatures both mundane and mythical. It was the man's recollection that revealed the horrifying truth about our sinister stalker. Simon relayed that according to the hermit, we were being hunted by a creature known in local legends as Opikitak. The beast, driven to mercilessly pursue humans invading its territory, was said to have haunted these canyons for centuries. And now, our intrusion had provoked its wrath. The revelation was chilling and disheartening, striking fear into every marrow of our bones. However, Simon's voice conveyed a message of hope. His discovery had also led him to law enforcement officers stationed nearby. Informed about our situation and the existence of the monstrous Opic attack, their skepticism quickly faded as they listened in horrified intrigue. Moments after hearing from Simon and attempting to maintain calm composure, we heard something approach the cabin swiftly. For agonizing seconds, we braced ourselves for the assault of our relentless pursuer. The door creaked open hesitantly, revealing Simon with three officers, Don and Gwyn, Edith Richter, and Ethan Kingfisher. In that brief moment of relief from terror's vice-like grip came an opportunity for decisive action. Though our original plan was no longer viable— we found strength in numbers and remained united facing the unknown. We knew that with law enforcement accompanying us, rescue helicopters would arrive soon. Armed with this reassurance, 
palpable tension subsided slightly. Our collective focus shifted toward evacuating the canyon as quickly as possible, while avoiding crossing paths with Opik attack once more. In that brief moment of clarity amid chaos came a profound appreciation for life and all its precious moments. We had encountered something that most people would never experience, an elusive creature whose existence straddled the boundary between tangible life forms and local legend. Though it cost us one irreplaceable member of our group, their memory would live on in each retelling of our harrowing experience. As we boarded the rescue helicopter, we bade farewell to the rugged terrain that had been repurposed as both hideout and hunting ground. It was only then that I realized we had triumphed over an inevitable tragedy. The creature born from folklore and imprinted within our minds would forever serve as testimony of the dark, twisted valleys beneath that which we perceive as reality. I was driving down a narrow, winding road through the dense forest of upstate New York when I decided to pull over and stretch my legs. My name's Derek Sonder, a mechanic from a small town nearby. It had been a long day at work and I needed to take a break before continuing home. The crescent moon shone through the gaps in the tree branches as the sounds of crickets chirped all around me. As I stopped by a fallen log, the wind rattled leaves passing eerily close to my ankles. I shivered and wrapped my arms tightly around myself, trying to keep warm. It was then that I heard it, soft footsteps echoing somewhere in the dark depths of the woods. I paused to listen keenly but dismissed it as the night playing tricks on me. A middle-aged man came stumbling out of the woods smeared in blood and dirt. I recognized him as my next-door neighbor, Clarence Warren. He began blurting out an incoherent story about his wife Patricia. With my help, he managed to explain how she'd been dragged off by some monstrous creature deeper into the forest. Fear gripped me even though I didn't fully understand what happened or what Clarence saw. Desperate to search for Patricia ourselves, we ventured back into those looming woods. Armed with only our flashlights, we crept deeper into its darkness where our only light sources were our tiny beams slicing through the gloom. Clarence's tales became more jumbled stories of something crawling within those trees, something sinister. The air grew colder, chilling us both through our protective winter wear. Conversation turned into whispers as we tensed upon feeling unseen eyes watching us from beyond the shadows of tall trees. Suddenly we heard it again, those distinct footsteps crunching twigs and dried flora underfoot in an almost predatory manner. We stood their heart pounding and breath ragged beneath deafening silence save for those thudding steps slowly approaching. Before I could react— a horrid growl thundered in the darkness, and we knew we were in its territory. It became clear the predator was this demonic beast stalking us from within the shadows. Panic surged into our veins, and we dashed through that tangled undergrowth, our fear driving us as one primal force against this unknown monster's vast presence. We ran blindly through the darkness searching for any way to escape those pursuing footfalls immersing themselves closer with each falling heartbeat. We stumbled upon an abandoned cabin standing alone in a small clearing obscured by untamed wilderness. Holding on to each other, we threw that door wide open and bolted inside in hopes of sanctuary from our unseen pursuer tirelessly stalking mere steps behind us. It was then we heard the rustling of leaves and branches momentarily relent before resuming all around that cabin's fragile wooden frame, our antagonist taunting us from within Shadow's veil. Vale. Clarence muttered something about a shotgun passed down generations from his father. I could see it leaning against the far wall. With trembling hands and broken resolve, he clumsily loaded those shells into the firearm's ancient chambers 
knowing fully well it might not be enough to protect us from this nefarious creature hounding our every move. We barricaded ourselves within that dusty haven of unkempt wooden floors and decaying wallpaper, hoping to catch our breath as we awaited some momentary security born from sheer adrenaline-fueled determination. Our ears strained desperately listening for any sign of movement outside in those increasingly oppressive woods where shadows loomed thicker with each passing second. An abrupt guttural snarl burst forth shattering what little peace remained with echoing finality. It was closer now, much closer. The cabin shook on its weak foundation as those grotesque claws scratched relentlessly at that flimsy door we'd slammed shut in futility. Cold wind flowed through the cracks, hitting our faces like ice daggers, no doubt carrying upon it the toxic scent of our terror. Desperation choked us as that hideous creature pounded against the wooden frame upon which our fragile existence precariously rested. The door began splintering, broken by wild fury invoked by sheer primal hunger and instinctual malice. Sweat glazed our brows as we prepared for what we knew to be an inevitable confrontation between man and beast where hope was a fading illusion in these merciless woods. I grabbed my friend's arm and pulled him towards the window. We need to escape through there, I whispered urgently. He nodded in agreement, his eyes wide with fear. Together, we managed to pry open the old window and hastily climbed out into the night. We sprinted through the dense forest, branches whipping our faces while we desperately tried to put as much distance as possible between us and that grisly monster. The sound of its roar followed us through the darkness, growing closer despite our frantic efforts. As we ran, I thought about calling for help but quickly realized how futile it would be. Even if someone heard our cries, they wouldn't be able to reach us in time or combat this malicious beast plaguing us. It seemed that all hope was lost and that we had become nothing more than prey for this insidious predator. Our flight continued until my friend tripped on an exposed root and fell. My heart pounded in my chest as I struggled to help him up, knowing that monster would be upon us within seconds. Attempting to shield him from its lethal grip, I couldn't suppress a shriek as its colossal figure appeared before us. As I examined its grotesque form more closely, it became clear what it was, a hideous amalgamation of human limbs and feral animalistic features. Its snout drooled with venomous saliva, dripping onto the forest floor, while its massive arms seemed capable of tearing someone apart effortlessly. To my astonishment, my friend managed to pull out his phone and snapped a photo of the beast, despite his trembling hands. As he did so, the creature hesitated for just a moment before letting out another horrifying roar and lunging towards us. I pushed my friend out of the way with every ounce of strength left in me, taking the force of the brutal attack. Severe pain consumed me as sharp claws ripped into my flesh leaving my vision clouded with red. The last thing I remember was my friend's anguished cries before everything went black. When I finally awoke, I found myself lying in a hospital bed with my friend sitting beside me. He explained how after the creature had attacked me, it seemed to lose interest and retreated back into the darkness leaving us alone but irreversibly scarred by the terrifying experience. While recovering, my friend handed me his phone, displaying a blurry image of the monstrous entity responsible for our torment. He had done some research using this photo, determined to answer what hellish creature had been our tormentor. As he showed me articles upon articles about various creatures from ancient folklore, we finally uncovered its identity. It was an embodiment of primal rage and malice, the likes of which preyed upon anyone who dared trespass upon its territory. While not mentioned in popular culture or commonly known, 
It had been described throughout history as a nightmarish creature stalking unsuspecting victims and inflicting unspeakable terror upon them. Our fates seemed to be sealed once we entered that cursed forest, and our confrontation with this monster would become a part of such timeless tales, whispers of its horrors shared between generations. My heart aches for those who lost their lives to that gruesome beast, and snared by its relentless hunger for terror. Now, with my recovery nearing completion and my friends standing steadfastly by my side through this harrowing ordeal, we can only hope that this creature remains in the depths of the forest, trapped within the pages of myth where it belongs. For if there's one thing we've learned from this savage encounter, it's that humankind is no match for such an overpowering force born from primeval dread. I stepped into the dense woods of Shenandoah National Park, tightly gripping my trusty hunting rifle. My name is Cyrus Muldoon, a seasoned hunter with years of experience to sharpen my instincts. A far cry from my mundane office job back home, hunting game out here in the wilderness brought a sense of thrill and adventure that made me feel alive. Navigating through the seemingly endless foliage, I noticed an odd set of tracks on the ground. Despite having hunted in these woods many times before, I had never come across anything quite like these tracks curiosity piqued. I decided to follow them. As I delved deeper into the thick forest, I discovered multiple instances of disturbed underbrush and mutilated bushes. It seemed as if something large and heavy had barreled its way through these parts with reckless abandon. Remaining cautious, I pressed on. The further I ventured in pursuit, a rank and repulsive odor assaulted my senses. This sent a chill down my spine. Although faint traces of iron were familiar to me as a hunter, this reek went beyond any rotting carcass or stagnant water I'd encountered before. While tracking down this odious source, I suddenly heard faint cries coming from a distance. The timbre sounded human and distressed, possibly someone injured or lost in these expansive woods. But this was rare considering how experienced most hunters were who ventured in here. Moreover, in all these years of hunting alone here I had never encountered anyone in need at all. Dropping caution, now filled with concern for what those desperate sounds may entail, I rushed in the direction of their origin. In haste the low-hanging branches scraped against my arms without notice as my legs carried me forward relentlessly across an ascending treacherous terrain. Finally reaching the source, I found myself staring at a harrowing sight. A hunter lay splayed on the ground beneath a tree-pinned collapsed tent. Immediately I activated the emergency beacon on my watch. Though given my secluded location I understood help was likely hours away. As I knelt to console the badly hurt man, whose face strained of all color yet etched in palpable terror, he managed to utter a chilling phrase. The creature, it took Larissa. His eyes then fluttered shut. Jolted by those words, filled with trepidation, my senses heightened even more. The only audible sound was of my heart pounding in my chest and ringing in my ears. Trying to stay calm and decipher the situation, a faint crunching sound caused by slow deliberate steps behind me seemed louder than thunderous drums. I turned around as steadily as possible and came face to face with an abomination unlike any predator I knew. The brute was twice my size, hunched over with rotting flesh dripping from its malformed body its predatory stare baleful under glowing green eyes that burned through the shadows. The creature continued to close in. With rifle poised to take aim, my body trembled while my finger tremored near the trigger at this moment just like another time during past when I lost all hope after discovering betrayal of me by one of loveliest souls whom I trusted with all that was dear to me. 
The memories from back then surged through every sinew as this betonoir came one step closer. Aware that any movement might provoke the creature, I spoke softly but firmly. I've called for help. They'll be here soon. The creature hesitated, regarding me with its eerie glow. When it advanced further, I raised the rifle and shouted loudly, hoping to drive it away or at least gain some time. To my shock, it halted its bulky body twitched as if considering my threat. Hoping to keep the creature focused on me and give Larissa a chance, I slowly backed away, maintaining eye contact. In what seemed like an eternity but was merely minutes, the situation changed. A distant wailing filled the air. The beacon on my wrist had worked. The creature's attention shifted from me onto the approaching sound. Whether from confusion or fear, it took two labored steps back. Trying to capitalize on this slight reprieve, I retreated faster and carefully maneuvered around some trees. My body screamed in pain and protest as I ran through the dense woods back to camp. As I stumbled into the clearing, a group of rangers burst through, armed and ready for a blood-curdling fight. Their arrival had stopped the creature from pursuing me, or so I presumed. They quickly assessed the badly injured hunter and rushed him onto a makeshift stretcher. Their leader approached and asked about Larissa's whereabouts. Senior Ranger Thompson told me they had heard her faint cries deeper in the forest near where they'd found the collapsed tent pinned under a tree. I nodded with understanding and relief as we all realized we needed to act fast to find Larissa. However, catching sight of a bloodied article of clothing on the forest floor only heightened my alarm. Thompson divided his team into pairs while emphasizing that no one should engage with or startle the beast by mentioning having seen an unknown creature lurking in these woods before disappearing into nothingness after causing tremendous harm and chaos. Under the guide's direction, I partnered with another ranger to scout the nearby area for Larissa. As the sun dipped below the horizon, we ventured deeper into the forest guided by nothing but our flashlights. Finally, our efforts paid off when we heard a whimper. A few yards away, poorly hidden behind some undergrowth, was Larissa badly injured but alive. When we reached her we recognized the extent of her injuries. The creature had mauled her severely before leaving her to suffer. As shocked as we were by the sight, our resolve to get her medical attention propelled us into action. Once transported back to camp, Larissa's condition was stabilized with first aid in preparation for more extensive treatment at a hospital. The creature hadn't been seen or heard from since that evening. With no knowledge of folklore or any similar reported incidents, there was little anyone could do but hope that the creature wouldn't return. News of the encounter quickly became public. Reporters and wildlife enthusiasts flooded the area by daybreak. Some speculated that it was a mutant animal or an unknown species, while others deemed it pure fantasy. Though my heart ached for those affected particularly Larissa and her family, I couldn't break free from a lingering thought. Days later, after encountering specialists studying the events that transpired in that secluded location— I learned they were focused on identifying this creature, classifying it as an unprecedented mutation or never-before-seen species. While I wasn't keen on reliving this haunting experience, I owed it to everyone who suffered because of this merciless beast. And so, I provided detailed accounts and records to assist in determining its existence. By working alongside experts in various scientific fields understandably reserved in their conclusions given insufficient evidence and analysis, I hope that exposing this creature would help us understand it better and prevent future bloodshed. In time when my wounds began to fade and life moved forward, I knew that the creature's devastation cannot be forgotten. Grief and sorrow plagued me for the lives lost and changed. Despite a morass of unanswered questions remaining, 
I was slowly returning to semblance of normalcy. I'm out hunting in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey, having left my wife and kids back home to enjoy some alone time. Someone once told me there's nothing quite like the thrill of stalking your prey, and they were right. The sun is just above the horizon when I make it to my tree stand, waiting patiently for any sign of movement. Surrounded by tall pines and the sound of rustling leaves, I've always found peace in these woods. But today feels different. Kicking off my boots, I climb the tree and settle into position. As I look down at the cracked leaves forming a floral carpet, I start thinking about my work at the garage. Everyone always says my skills as a mechanic are unparalleled. I even managed a few chuckles sharing how one client mixed up brake fluid with oil. Hours ticking by were marked only by the occasional fracture of twigs underfoot as deer moved in the distance. Then, following an eerie silence, something caught my eye far across the clearing. My heart raced. In that instant, a figure emerged unlike anything I'd seen before, lithe and agile, almost human but covered in what appeared to be dark gray fur. Its limbs moved like spider legs, elongated and unnerving. It sniffed at the ground ferociously like an animal tracking its prey. The sense of dread washed over me tell me that was just some uncanny figment of my imagination. No sound save my pulse escaped as it shot through the underbrush and possibly fast the hunter stalking an unseen target. When it finally happened upon a young man, alone and lost, I was completely frozen. Panic welled inside me as bile filled my throat. I could no longer breathe silently with panic. Through clenched teeth, I reached for the old walkie-talkie hanging off a branch while keeping an eye on that monstrous thing below me. I managed to call out quietly for help, desperately praying someone would hear my call. Hope flickered with static nobody replied. It was then the creature lunged onto the hapless man. Devouring him with grotesque efficiency, blood and bones sprayed everywhere like an explosion. My stomach twisted and turned as I witnessed firsthand a gruesome and maddening dance of gore. Snapping back to reality, I thought of my only option, use my hunting rifle. As much as the hairs stood on the back of my neck, knowing what I Ellis Brady was up against, the monster below me could not go unchecked. I drew a breath, stealing myself as I slowly began to steady my rifle. The nightmare below me didn't notice as it continued its grim feast. I took one last deep breath and pulled the trigger. The bullet tore through the air in what felt like an eternity before it impacted the creature's head, bringing its horrifying feast to an abrupt halt. As it fell to the ground, I stared at the lifeless body of the young man my mind unable to process the enormity of what had just transpired. My hands shook as I lowered my weapon, glancing around nervously for any signs of more monsters lurking in the shadows. Fearing for my life, I realized that I could not stay in this area any longer. I had to find help. I started running down a familiar path which led me to the main road where I spotted a passing patrol car. Waving them down was a challenge given my state of shock and panic, but thankfully, they noticed me. Upon pulling over, two officers emerged from the police car. I hastily recounted the grisly scene I had just witnessed and participated in, my voice quivering with each gruesome detail. The officers stared at me in disbelief but decided they should investigate nonetheless. We returned to the site of carnage together and approached with caution, unsure if more monsters might be lying in wait. We discovered that both the creature and the victim were now missing, somehow dragged away into obscurity. At that moment, one of the officers received a call on his radio about other incidents involving a similar creature across town. 
Realizing that there might be multiple creatures attacking our community, panic began to spread amongst us like wildfire. Desperate and overwhelmed by fear, we returned to their vehicle and sped off towards town. We knew we needed to warn everyone about what was happening and contact any other authorities or specialists who might help us deal with these attacks. We made multiple stops throughout town relaying information about these vicious creatures and urging people to find shelter until further notice. There was no time for questions or explanations. We simply had to convince them that their lives were in imminent danger. Multiple squads of police officers and heavily armed volunteers were assembled and sent out in search of the creatures. The hunt was on, but little did they know that these creatures were as elusive as they were dangerous. The rest of the night was filled with fear, chaos, and bloodshed. More bodies were found in various locations, torn apart by the frenzy of these ferocious beasts. In total, 13 people lost their lives that night, including two police officers involved in the search operation. After 72 long hours, the town was deemed safe once again without any further sightings or reports. The specialists and authorities conducted thorough investigations, trying to determine what these creatures were and why they had suddenly started attacking our town. Though many theories were proposed, we could only hypothesize their existence based on the clear evidence of their savagery. While life eventually returned to normal for most people in town, I still could not shake the image of that brutal scene in the woods. Every time I closed my eyes, I watched helplessly as the nightmarish creature feasted on its prey, an unprepared young man whose life had been snuffed out too soon. The tragic memories of those victims would forever linger and haunt our once peaceful community. We grieve for them daily as we try to move forward, a solemn reminder of that terrifying week when chaos reigned. No one knows if those horrific creatures will ever return, but one thing is certain, our world has changed forever. And while I never wanted any part of this nightmare-inducing reality, it's an experience that will bind us all together in our shared quest for survival and understanding. As the sun dipped behind the trees, I walked into the dense forest of Blackwater Woods, located in Florida. It wasn't my first time here, but today felt different. My name's Hank LeBlanc, and I'm an experienced hunter. It's my escape from daily life as a janitor at the local school. You ready for this? My buddy Jared yelled. His bushy beard covered his grin. Leaf-covered ground crunched underfoot as we traversed deeper into the woods. Birds chirped above us, and small critters watched cautiously from tree branches. Every so often, we stopped to take in our surroundings, attempting to spot a deer or wild boar. I hear there's something strange going on in these woods, I said, recalling whispers in town about mysterious disappearances and attacks. But we shook off those stories as old folktales meant to scare children. As dusk approached, we stumbled upon a shallow cave with scratches lining its entrance, deep gouges ripping through earth, and stone alike. Weighed by sudden unease, we were about to move away when we heard distant cries for help. Drawn to it, we sprinted through the darkening underbrush until we reached a clearing where a middle-aged man lay on the ground, his leg twisted grotesquely. He warned us about a creature that had attacked him but had fled when he fired his shotgun. Our skepticism faded as fear began to grip our hearts. This was no tale. Our lives were truly at risk. I realized then that calling for help was not an option. Our phones were useless deep within these dense woods. Limping and silent, Jared relied on me for support as we retraced our path towards safety. But every rustling leaf or snapping twig sent us deeper into panic. Was it only the wind, or something far more sinister? 
The sun had set entirely now, swallowed by the forest's darkness. All that remained were the haunting whispers of our deadliest fears. The creature was a beast we could never have comprehended, part predator, part nightmare. The misplaced laughter of a hyena split the night, freezing us in place. Our flashlights danced across the darkness before finally focusing on its source. A looming figure perched atop a nearby boulder, eyes gleaming with malicious intent. This hulking monstrosity resembled a twisted canine, its fur matted with crimson gore. It was something I would never have seen coming, nor would I ever wish upon anyone else. Do you smell that? Jared whispered to me, his grip tightening on my arm. I took a deep breath, but it didn't help. There was a foul smell in the air, of rotting meat, perhaps, that made me gag. Jared must have caught a whiff of it, too, because he said, What the hell is that? Let's go! With adrenaline pumping through our veins, we desperately hobbled along the trail, struggling to support Jared's injured leg. Our flashlights flickered like scared fireflies in the oppressive darkness. We could hear it breathing heavily behind us as it drew closer. The sound of gravel crunching beneath its massive paws filled our ears. I knew we couldn't outrun it for long, especially with Jared injured. Our only hope was to find other people on the trails and rope them into helping us escape. As if answering our unspoken prayers, we spotted campfires in the distance. Seeing the minuscule glimmer of hope propelled us forward. With each step, Jared's pain steadily worsened until we were practically dragging him. As we reached the campfire site, we shouted for help. The astonished campers stared at us. One moment they were laughing and roasting marshmallows. Next thing they knew, two panic-stricken men appeared out of nowhere. Help! There's something chasing us! I shouted between ragged breaths. Their laughter died down instantly as they grasped the situation. Quickly huddling together and arming themselves with anything they could find, a camping pot, a tree branch, they formed a makeshift barricade around the campsite. Their selflessness and bravery stunned me but didn't allay my fear entirely. That grotesque creature was still out there, stalking us. The fact that it had survived a shotgun blast didn't make matters any better. We listened intently for any signs of our pursuer but heard nothing, only deafening silence enveloping us like a thick fog. I decided against calling the authorities, stating what we had encountered in the woods. They wouldn't believe us and waste precious time arguing, time during which the beast could strike. Unbeknownst to us, the creature had found a way to slink into the campsite silently. Suddenly, one of the girls screamed as blood splattered all over her face. An arm, or what was left of it, crashed down at our feet. The nightmare scene unfolded before us. Our would-be savior being brutally torn apart by that hideous monster as we watched helplessly. The campsite erupted into chaos. People scattered in all directions as the monstrosity continued mauling its victim with viciousness that made my stomach churn. It looked up at us with a growl rattling its throat, eyes ablaze with a primal fury that sent a shudder down my spine. We didn't waste any more time. Grabbing Jared, I dashed away from the campsite with renewed frenetic energy, other campers following close behind. Weaving through trees and bushes, I tried to ignore the horrific sounds echoing from back where we left our fallen comrade. Jared's breathing grew labored, whether in pain or terror, I couldn't say. Eventually, we stumbled upon a dirt road with tire tracks leading away from it. We followed them blindly, praying they'd lead us back to civilization and safety. Through sheer willpower, we emerged near an old gas station and collapsed on the ground next to each other. A passerby found us there soon after and called an ambulance for Jared. It took me several minutes, 
but I mustered enough courage to speak again. It killed him, I whispered uneasily, recounting what had happened back at the campsite. Jared simply nodded in silence, his eyes conveying an ocean of emotions that no words ever would. As we parted ways at the hospital, I couldn't help but wonder if that horrifying beast was still out there somewhere, stalking other innocent victims as it had done with us. But my gut told me one thing. I would never, ever return to those dark and foreboding woods. That creature would remain an enigma to us, its true origins shrouded in an unnerving mystery. And though I couldn't identify what it was, I vowed to remember its cruel deeds and pay tribute to those who fell prey to its savage instincts. I never thought I would become a hunter. Growing up in the city, the closest thing I had to wildlife was pigeons. But there I was, deep in the Redwood National Forest in California, rifle in hand, ready to hunt for my first trophy. My cousin, Peter Eddington, was my hunting partner. He finally convinced me to join him after years of bragging about his hunting exploits. After moving to a small house in the woods, life had grown monotonous, so this invitation felt like a breath of fresh air. As we started our day through the dense forest, it felt more like a nature walk than hunting. Peter and I spent hours conversing about our childhood memories and catching up. The sun began to set when we heard movement rustling leaves nearby. Sure. Do you hear that? Sounds like something big, whispered Peter. We approached the noise carefully with our guns ready. As we got closer, we stumbled upon something gruesome. A human body lay mangled on the ground it seemed as if some large creature had torn it apart with brute force. What on earth happened here? I stammered, frozen with shock and disbelief. Peter's face turned pale as he replied. No idea, but we need to call for help immediately. We checked for cell phone reception, but there was none at all. Nevertheless, we agreed that at least one of U.S. should stay near the body while the other went to find help. Peter insisted on staying behind and requested me to go back and call for help. Before leaving him alone, he tried lightening up our heavy hearts with a joke about how living in the city ruined his dating life since women preferred outdoorsmen like himself. I set off into the late afternoon with a feeling of urgency mixed with dread. Every sound I heard heightened my worries and slowed me down but I knew that I couldn't abandon Peter in this dangerous situation. As night fell and I neared the edge of the forest, a chilling roar echoed through the woods. It was something I had never heard before a terrifyingly primal and guttural sound. In my bones I knew that something terrible must have happened to Peter. I sprinted back in the direction of the ominous noise, trying to push through my terror. What I found left me speechless. A huge, monstrous creature stood over Peter's unconscious body. It was hulking and covered with coarse hair that blended into the dim light from moon. Its eyes were ruby-red, reflecting malice and hate. The creature, noticing my presence, snarled and lunged at me. I instinctively started running, heart pounding, and mind racing with thoughts of escape and survival. I desperately searched for a way to distance myself from the creature while also trying to find help for Peter. As I sprinted through the forest, branches slapped my face and tore at my clothing. I felt the weight of each step slowing me down, but I couldn't afford to stop or give in to exhaustion. Throughout my wild run, the sounds of growls and heavy footsteps pierced the night air behind me, serving as a constant reminder of the imminent threat. At one point I stumbled upon an old hunter's cabin, abandoned and rotting but still standing. With no time to think it over, I burst inside and slammed the door shut behind me, panting heavily. 
The cabin was far from ideal, dark, cramped, and littered with debris from years of abandonment. But it was all that stood between me and certain death at the hands of whatever hellish monster was chasing us. The roar from outside the cabin shook the walls and rattled my teeth in my skull. Taking advantage of this brief moment of reprieve, I rummaged through long-forgotten camping supplies left in a dusty corner. Desperate for any means of communication or defense, I finally found an old radio emitting scratchy tones after frantically twisting its knobs. Realizing this might be our only chance for help, I managed to connect with emergency services. What's your emergency? Came a voice on the other end. I. We need help. I gasped between heavy breaths. There's something attacking us in the forest that's killed one person already. The dispatcher urged me to stay calm before asking for clarification about our location and situation details. Ere long, Emergency services were on their way, but it would take hours for them to arrive due to the remote nature of our location. Fighting back the urge to let exhaustion overtake me, I propped myself against the cabin wall, trying my hardest not to make a sound as every eerie noise outside further heightened my anxiety. The unknown creature continued its pursuit, circling around the cabin and slamming itself against the walls threatening to come crashing through at any moment. Hours crawled by as if being pulled on a slow-motion treadmill of dread. As day finally broke, the relentless monster backed away and wandered deeper into the woods. Exhausted and bloodied, but grateful for every second of life remaining, I stumbled out from the cabin and retraced my steps back towards Peter. I found Peter lying unconscious but still breathing. With shaky hands, I tended to him as best I could. Eventually, we heard distant sirens cutting through the morning's silence. Help had arrived. We were rescued and transported out of the forest for medical treatment and questioning. The gruesome death of our fellow hiker was deemed an unexplainable wildlife attack by local authorities. The creature that haunted us that night remains a terrifying enigma, something we can't explain or understand. The news spread quickly through our hometown community. Some people whispered about it behind closed doors. Others chose not to speak of it at all. As for Peter and me, we survived, albeit terribly scarred both physically and mentally by our harrowing ordeal. In time... I began researching local history books and online resources in a futile attempt at explaining what we'd encountered. Unfortunately, none ever seemed to match the description of the grotesque thing that hunted us in that desolate forest. Questions remained unanswered. What was that beast? Was it still out there? We'll probably never know what happened that night if it was an isolated incident or part of something larger lurking within these ancient woodlands. But one thing is clear. When the darkness creeps in and eerie sounds echo through the trees, people are haunted by a creature that has no place in our known world. I remember the chill of the morning air as it crept through the pines of Jedediah Smith Redwood State Park. It was crisp, almost biting, but not unfamiliar or unwelcome on my skin. My name is Ina Grady, and I'm a park ranger here. My parents were fond of Greenlandic culture, hence my strange name, a point of mild interest when meeting new hikers. I had started the day with routine boundary checks. The terrain here in Northern California could be unforgiving, and I had my fair share of rescuing unprepared tourists from glorified nature walks gone awry. But today wasn't going to be about lost tourists or bandaging scraped knees. It began with a couple reporting a disrupted campsite, tents torn apart, belongings scattered like leaves in a storm. A family who camped the previous night hadn't checked out, nor had they been seen leaving. 
Violent animal attacks were rare but not unheard of. Yet, there was no blood, no tracks, atypical for any beast indigenous to this region. As hours passed under the stoic watch of ancient trees, a creeping unease settled upon me. The silence held too much weight, like it was hiding something breathing just beyond sight, an absurd thought that stuck nevertheless. The missing family's car remained in its place at the campsite. They were avid outdoors enthusiasts by all accounts, not ones to wander off unprepared. Phones and wallets remained in the car, a half-eaten sandwich laid on the front seat. Hunger clawed at me, but nerves won over appetite as I resolved to widen my search. I called for backup but signal problems persisted. A common annoyance here but timing could not have been worse. With radio hisses providing cold comfort, isolation became palpable. The crunch underneath each step seemed louder as dusk approached, though night fell hours later than most places due to dense treetops shielding the forest floor from early darkness. Lantern in hand, I swept light over ferns and redwood trunks so wide they felt like walls closing in. That's when I saw it, an aberration within nature's design, a figure cloaked not in shadows but awkwardly bulging from behind a tree one far too large for any known local wildlife. It had limbs that hung too long, joints that bent wrong, a grotesque parody of a human form. My mind raced with logical explanations. Poachers using extravagant costumes to evade detection? Or perhaps pranksters aiming to incite panic? Neither held much credibility given my current solitude. A sound escaped from it a sickening crackle like breaking sticks mixed with a guttural rumbling that turned my insides cold despite the logic I clung to fiercely. Remembering laughter helped then, jokes shared with colleagues about forest phantoms, meant to scare greenhorns, all nonsensical and fun until reality conjured something far worse from legend. My grip tightened on my firearm, a protocol breach maybe, but instinct commanded every fiber of my being as that creature moved into clear view. In an act of desperation, I clicked the radio transmitter dangling from my shoulder, hoping to reach someone, anyone. This is Officer Birch. I need immediate assistance at. My voice trailed off as I realized I didn't know my exact coordinates. The figure lurched forward, its limbs moving in an unsettling, disjointed manner that betrayed a ruthless intent. Its skin was a patchwork of mottled grays and browns. Its eyes, if it had any, were hidden beneath folds of what looked like coarse hide. I backed away slowly, keeping my firearm trained on the figure. Despite my dread, firing without a clear target went against every protocol. But this thing, it wasn't human. It was clear as it took another disjointed step toward me and let out a deep, resonating growl that pulsed through the air. I reached a clearing and stumbled into view of a lookout station. There I found Jonesy, old-timer and radio operator. Jonesy! I yelled. He rushed out, surveying the scene with wide eyes. Together we locked ourselves inside the station as heavy thuds sounded against the flimsy door. Through shaking hands, Jonesy managed to send out an emergency broadcast, his fingers more familiar with the dials than mine would ever be. We could only wait, our eyes locked on the station's sole window as shadows danced in our periphery. By luck or some divine providence, a helicopter tore through the sky above us. It carried marks not of our local force but of the state troopers, a unit who had been in the area for routine exercises. After what felt like hours but was mere minutes, we watched as lights settled upon the lurking monstrosity outside. Caught in a beam of light that seemed too pure for it to bear, it writhed and retreated with sounds more distressing than any living thing should make. The state troopers touched down not far from us. Guns at ready and cautious steps marked their advance toward the station. 
We recounted our ordeal as best we could while medics examined us for shock and injury. The creature had vanished into the woods by then. The troopers found nothing but upturned earth where it stood moments before. They chalked it up to a bear, a simple explanation for those who hadn't witnessed its grotesque form themselves. There were no casualties but one, Jonas's calm demeanor. He'd retired years too late, but finally recognized this encounter as his cue to leave. Inquiries followed. Stories circulated about bear attacks that were rebuffed by anyone who heard our tale firsthand. The truth remained out there amongst twisted underbrush and ancient trees, a truth not even I dared to confront again. I took early retirement following that incident. Frequent nightmares made sleep elusive despite therapy sessions and time's gentle passage. As I write this account now, my report to whoever finds reason in these words, I acknowledge that perhaps some wilderness should remain undisturbed by civilization's footprint and some horrors left untold for sanity's sake. I remember the way the sun glazed over Redwood National Park, its light peeking through the towering trees as I started my routine patrol. Name's Jonah Keane, park ranger here for the better part of a decade. Life's a solitary kind of pleasure for a ranger, one you have to be born to appreciate. This place, with its raw beauty, tends to strip life back to the essentials. My day began like any other weaving through the underbrush and ensuring every hiker and camper followed the guidelines. It wasn't until I reached a less trailed area near Bald Hills that I stumbled upon the first sign something was amiss. A tent, shredded to ribbons yet drenched in due no sign of struggle but missing its occupants. Equipment lay scattered as if an invisible force had swept through without care for human belongings. No cries for help broke the stillness. Why hadn't they called out? Maybe they left in haste, or something prevented them. I shuddered at that thought, same as everyone else around these parts, though not from cold or fear, just instinctive caution. As I radioed in the situation using formal codes rather than names, another ranger suggested wild animals or even a feuding couple on the lamb. Seemed logical enough, but logic doesn't always solve the knots in your gut. Hours stretched on as we searched. Ground gave way to night's approach and with it an unsettling discovery. Scattered belongings led to an open space where earth bore stains darker than shadows under moonlight. Fresh, too, someone had been injured here and badly. We pressed on and as night deepened we heard it first branches snapping with disciplined rhythm, not like any animal I knew of or dared imagine. Then we saw its silhouette against the sliver of moonlight. Disproportionately large arms hung by its sides swaying purposefully as it moved. Body scarred and matted with what seemed like vegetation, it towered easily seven feet tall with hands broad enough to envelope a man's chest whole its face indiscernible beneath layers of mottled skin or something else. Our flashlights trembled with our hands, and two green glints flickered back from the darkness, eyes unreflective of any life known to man or nature, malicious intelligence behind them. Dialing back panic and assumption is everything while you're clad in a badge and given trust with people's safety. Our protocols didn't involve tales told around bonfires or whispers of old legends we deal with flesh and blood threats. But this creature was flesh and blood too, wasn't it? Or something more malignant masquerading under such guise? As we regrouped to form a game plan, reluctant weapons drawn for protection more than assault, our radios crackled abruptly into life only to fall silent again before coherent words formed. There was another rustle behind me, then everything erupted into chaos. I turned, lured by a second rustle behind me. Branches cracked sharply, 
a footfall followed by another. My partner and I locked eyes, the message clear. We split without a word. I pounded across the forest floor, my partner in the opposite direction. Distance grew between us, the creature's heavy steps growing louder in pursuit of one target, me. I ran, legs pumping, lungs tight with effort. Radio forgotten, my focus was escape. Calls for help would wait. The woods swallowed noise and signal alike. Any attempt to contact dispatch was futile among thick trees and topography that played havoc with communications. Heart pounding like a drumbeat against my chest, I glanced over my shoulder. The creature surged through the underbrush. Proximity brought detail. Thick hair bristled on its arms, dirt caked on like armor plate. Fingers ended in cracked nails, earth-stained and rough. Ahead lay a clearing with moonlight painting a silver path across open space. Safety or exposure? Seconds to decide. I chanced it. Its size might hinder it where saplings grew dense. It bellowed in anticipation or frustration the sound guttural and devoid of language. I burst into the open field under Moon's watchful eye and darted for a copse of younger trees on the far side. Mid-stride, a sharp pain ripped through my calf as I stumbled forward crashing to the ground. Looking back, blood soaked through torn fabric around a deep gash not life-threatening but debilitating. The creature approached at a walk now, it seemed certain of its coming victory. Grasping for my sidearm proved tough with hands shaking, from fear or exertion mattered little. Shots fired into dirt and bark as the creature sidestepped with surprising agility for its size. Now it was close enough to touch, and the smell, metallic, like blood mixed with rot, filled my nose as its shadow fell over me. Suddenly, gunfire erupted from my right, my partner managed to circle back undetected. Diverted attention gave me precious seconds. Despite the searing pain in my leg, I rolled away towards cover provided by nearby thickets. We maneuvered around it, keeping enough distance to avoid its reach but close enough to keep it engaged and unsure of which one of us to chase after. One last look as we retreated confirmed what we dealt with was no man standing on two feet yet monstrous in musculature and form, terrifyingly alive but unlike anything learned about from field guides or training manuals could explain. Summoning our last ounce of strength, we made it back to our cruiser just as dawn broke and reinforcements arrived following our overdue check-in call triggered alarms. They found us bloodied but alive, Tales of an indescribable beast met with skepticism until they saw the claw marks that marred steel doors and bulletproof glass shattered like safety never existed. Weeks passed since that night. Recovery meant recounting events over official reports that read more fantasy than fact despite physical evidence no one could refute or make sense of. Leaves turned color and fell since then. Routines resumed part of life cycle yet whispers circulated about an unexplained presence in those same woods that forever changed two lives that crossed its path. Would-be explorers approached ground zero with caution. Local tales evolved influenced by facts but steeped in human attempts to comprehend what felt beyond understanding. We returned often to duties assigned without mental closure offered by logic, or reason because some answers remain elusive no matter how desperately we seek them out while others find solace in communities' shared experiences, united by what cannot be easily explained within scope of known nature or beast. This happened to me quite some time ago. I was headed to a secluded cabin in the Appalachian Mountains with my co-workers, Lana Klein and Derek Upshaw. We had planned a small retreat to brainstorm new marketing strategies away from the distractions of our bustling office. Upon reaching the cabin, 
we wasted no time setting up our workstations near the roaring fireplace. As daytime turned to dusk, we began recounting stories about our lives outside of work. I shared my humble upbringing in a rural farm town and how it led me to be resourceful with the limited resources available to me. Lana received a distressing phone call from her sister. Apparently, her nephew had been found dead nearby, his body brutally mauled as if an animal attacked him. However, no one could determine what kind of beast had inflicted such devastation. Lana's grief quickly faded into determination as she insisted on investigating her nephew's dreadful death. Not wanting her to face this challenge alone, Derek and I decided to join her in search for clues in the surrounding woods. As we ventured deeper into the wilderness, we came across other victims, hikers, campers, even woodland creatures exhibiting similar gruesome injuries as Lana's nephew. The pattern of these disturbing events was perplexing, but one thing became clear. The culprit seemed animalistic yet highly methodical, displaying an unnatural aptitude for hunting its prey. During our exploration, we discovered a deserted mining town known as Cahaba Bend. It appeared untouched for decades, eerily abandoned but preserved like a twisted time capsule. The locals had previously mentioned that unusual incidents in this area began generations ago. Now we were witnessing a horrifying continuation of decimation. Suddenly, we heard rustling noises nearby and caught sight of a peculiar creature lurking amongst the shadows. This monster was unlike any known wildlife it towered over us with muscular limbs covered in rough black scales. Vicious claws on its hands and feet accompanied with powerful jaws lined with razor-sharp teeth. It's unclear what triggered the beast's attention, but it began pursuing us relentlessly. We ran as fast as we could and managed to elude it temporarily, superfluously concealing our weapon-stocked backpack in a dilapidated storage shed on the outskirts of town. Later, Derek asked why no one called for help. To our dismay, our phones had no signal in this remote landscape. The creature's growls echoed through the haunted streets of Cahaba Bend while we discussed our options. I think it's attracted to the scent of blood, Lana proposed as I tended to a deep cut on her arm. Derek agreed, commenting on how efficiently it culled both weak and robust victims alike. Our adrenaline-fueled survival instincts kicked in as we devised a plan to retrace our steps and retrieve our hidden weaponry using my extensive knowledge of off-the-grid navigation techniques. With nothing but sheer wit and determination guiding us, we knew that grasping onto our time-tested skills was essential in order to confront the brutal antagonism lurking within this forsaken land. But before that, I tried lightening the mood with a jest about secretly always wanting to test my survival skills on reality television. However, these present circumstances were far beyond anything I'd ever envisioned. Tickled by awkward laughter amidst adrenaline-fueled fear, we resumed our mission. As darkness enveloped us completely, we gradually made our way back to the shed where we stashed our belongings. Moonlight filtered through the thick canopy above, casting eerie silhouettes and intensifying every snap of a twig or rustle of leaves beneath our feet. Our hearts pounded relentlessly, each beat weighing heavily on my chest like concrete blocks being piled onto me one by one. We finally reached the storage shed, discreetly reloading firearms which we had once left behind without even anticipating such dire need for self-defense. Each of us knew that we held a minuscule chance of surviving whatever laid ahead, but it was the only choice we had, for there was no turning back now. The shed was now our makeshift fortress, and we knew we needed to act fast. Weapons tightly gripped in hand, there was no time to think about the eerie antagonists that had brought us into this chaos-filled reality. Instead, we focused on the critical task of making our way out of these woods and finding help. 
Utilizing my knowledge of navigation techniques, we began moving cautiously, as silently as possible through the dense forest. The terrain proved to be treacherous, filled with hidden obstacles and life-threatening hazards that tested our determination at every turn. Every sound became menacing, every uncertainty increased our paranoia and amplified our need to reach safety. The creature made its presence known by its relentless pursuit, seeking to annihilate us utterly with every chilling encounter. One moment, we caught sight of it lurking in the shadows, its humanoid form almost too terrifying to comprehend. A guttural growl filled the air as sinister eyes locked onto ours from afar. In an instant, it darted from one spot to another, approaching closer with horrifying speed. Unable to deny my panic state any longer, I remembered I still had my phone within reach. Knowing full well that we needed assistance, I gave in and dialed 911 hoping against all odds for a glimmer of hope in rescue and reinforcements. However, our desperate attempt for help remained futile. The call dropped before we could even communicate our dire situation with the dispatcher. Frustration weighed down upon us as it seemed our only connection to the outside world had been severed. Our distress escalated even further when one member of our group foolishly snapped a twig while attempting to avoid stepping on a venomous snake slithering beside their foot. The noise was undeniably minuscule in comparison to the monstrous roars echoing around us. But it was enough for the creature to locate our position. With alarming severity and precision, the beast charged at us in a single, calculated motion. We scattered in different directions, hoping to avoid the onslaught. Its claws sliced through the air, narrowly missing my companion and leaving them with a thin, bleeding gash on their arm. In the heat of the moment, I fired a round in its direction. To our horror, the bullet had no discernible effect on the adversary, only further infuriating it and threatening our imminent demise. Incapable of fighting this creature with mere human strength and firepower, we found ourselves overwhelmed by dread. Regardless of our fear, our inescapable priority was survival. As individuals of pure instinct, we fought against the nightmare as best we could. Each encounter with our lethal pursuer took its toll on us physically and mentally while draining away hope and reducing us to tormented souls caught in an endless loop of violence. During a brief moment of respite from the ceaseless pursuit, my comrades injured but still alive— we finally stumbled upon a highway cutting through the dense foliage before us. It seemed almost surreal that this symbol of civilization appeared like an oasis amidst desolation. Collapsing on asphalt barely within the boundaries of safety, we were ultimately discovered by a passing motorist who immediately alerted emergency services to rescue us from this twisted reality. Though more battered and scared than ever before, Relief washed over us like ocean waves crashing into shore. The reality of what we faced continued to haunt us, an encounter that would forever etch itself into our collective psyche. The creature's identity remained a mystery, an enigma from which terrible thoughts crawled into existence through endless speculation concerning its origins. At times... Whispers of legends would pass between hushed voices as casual conversation turned to the topic of horror and lore. Speculation arose regarding skinwalkers or shapeshifters as potential explanations for our bizarre ordeal, yet nothing definitive that bore any semblance of credible truth. Instead of dwelling further upon paranormal possibilities outside our comprehension, we embraced the fact that we had survived our nightmare in those forsaken woods. Our gratitude would forever be for the bonds we forged in adversity, and the hope that guided us so desperately toward an escape from the abyss of primal terror.